right, everyone. Uh, welcome to the early Monday morning workshop of the Towards the Science of Consciousness 2022 uh, conference. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, testing orchestrative ob objective reduction. Uh, it's going to be an update on a joint project with the Templeton World Charity Foundation. Um, we have several speakers, uh, but most of them, i.e. everyone else except me, is remote. So, so we're going to be putting them up online. Um, first up, we're going to be having a talk by Dr. Jack Tuzinski. Uh, Dr. Tuzinski obtained his PhD in condensed matter physics in 1983 from the University of Calgary in Canada. Uh, from then till 1988, he went to the Department of Physics at Memorial University of Newfoundland in St. John's, Canada, and then moved to the University of Alberta in 1988. Uh, he has held uh, uh, professorships and research positions all over the world, including in China, Germany, France, Israel, Denmark, Belgium, Switzerland, and Italy. He has over 500 peer-reviewed uh, publications and journals, and he was my PhD supervisor, so it's my pleasure to introduce his talk. Uh, if we could just switch over to the recording. Unfortunately, he's not able to uh, be here in person today because he is traveling to Germany, so he provided this uh, presentation that we can watch. Thank you. Hello, friends and colleagues. Uh, welcome to the workshop on uh, uh, testing the uh, orchestrated objective reduction theory of consciousness. Um, my name is Jack Tuzinski. Um, first of all, I would like to apologize for not being able to be there uh, in, in person. And um, this is due to my uh, travel schedule. Um, but nonetheless, um, I'd like to give you a short introduction into this um, workshop and the idea behind it. Um, this is uh, largely uh, as a result of the uh, project that is sponsored, sponsored by the Templeton World Charity Foundation entitled Effects of Anesthetic Molecules on Quantum Vibrations and Microtubules, Experimental Testing of the Orcovar Theory of Consciousness. And uh, this project uh, has been under the joint um, management of uh, Professor Stuart Hamburg and myself. Um, and uh, it uh, encompasses uh, uh, several groups of uh, researchers um, listed here. Uh, Stuart Hammer from the University of Arizona, uh, Sir Roger Penrose from Oxford University, and Greg Scholes, Eric Calera, and collaborators from Princeton University. Aristide Dogario and his team at the University of Central Florida, and Bruce McIver from Stanford University, uh, and myself. We also have collaborators, uh, mainly on the um, computational side, uh, Dr. Travis Craddock from Novala Southeastern University in Florida, and uh, a couple of students from the Politecnico di Torino, Eric Zizi and Francesco Chirici. Um, this uh, project, of course, has a, a very long history uh, in terms of its roots and uh, motivation. It started with the very well-known and uh, highly popular book by Sir Roger Penrose, The Emperor's New Mind, which uh, unleashed a debate about the non-computability of uh, conscious human consciousness, um, the um, foundations, physical foundations of it, whether we need a new math and physics, uh, whether it has uh, quantum underpinnings and um, uh, in the intervening two or three decades, um, various proposals were made. And of course, uh, Sir Roger and Stuart Hameroff uh, wrote a number of papers which uh, proved to be groundbreaking and uh, provided some testable predictions um, of the um, assumptions made by Orcar, in the end, um, um, the assumptions boil down to two major um, fundamental uh, physical aspects. And the first one is the presence of quantum uh, interactions um, at the uh, uh, at the level of uh, subneuronal molecules, and uh, the the best candidate so far has been. The structure of a microtubule with tubal and dimers being the building blocks of microtubules. So the quantum aspect is number one. The second aspect is 
quantum gravity or gravitational collapse of the wave function. And um, both uh, of these assumptions are uh, currently under scrutiny. Uh, the gravitational aspect is not part of this project, but has been under investigation by a group from Italy um, um, who published some papers in uh, the past year. Um, uh, testing the ability of gravitational effects on uh, the collapse of a quantum wave function in general. So far, they have determined that um, objects uh, um, sm smaller than, let's say, 1,000 proton masses do not experience any such effects. But of course, we're dealing here with much larger objects. Um, Tubulin is uh, a protein dimer whose molecular weight is 110 kilodalton. So we still have a long way to go to determine if gravitational collapse is or is not at play here. However, um, let's uh, focus here on uh, this particular investigation, which strictly speaking deals with um, only quantum aspects and um, in particular with, um, uh, with, with whether quantum effects exist, number one, number two, if they are long lived enough for any meaningful biological function to be affected by them. And number three, are they long range enough um, so that they can propagate uh, hierarchically from uh, a tubule and dimer to a microtubule and from a microtubule to microtubule bundles and then from there to a neuron and between neurons uh, to groups of neurons, et cetera, et cetera. So, we are just uh, investigating the very, um, very uh, basic fundamental aspects. And if these uh, are confirmed, then of course we can take the following steps um, to, um, to determine whether OCORR is um, viable or not. Uh, one more thing um, that is, uh, of course, important from the point of view of consciousness is. Uh, the effects of anesthetics. This is the, the best way of controllably switching um, consciousness of human beings off temporarily, reversibly. So in this project, we also looked at anesthetics um, and the talks in this workshop will deal with all these aspects. Uh, I'm just giving you a broad, broad brush overview. So this is a structure of a well-known picture from, um, from um, Stuart Hameroff's papers in the past, uh, showing you the arrangement of parallel bundles of microtubules connected by um, microtubule-associated proteins um, in, a, in a very uh, well-organized architecturally um, system, which is suspected of being uh, conducive to quantum um, propagation of quantum interactions throughout. Um, so coming back to uh, the question of microtubules, as you can see here, um, microtubules have been um, envisaged as conduits for quantum interactions and based on similarity with um, photosynthetic systems, FMO um, structures in particular, um, in our previous papers, computationally and um, through um, theoretical investigations, we have shown that uh, tryptophan networks in tubulin are the primary candidate for quantum excitations, which could be delocalized and sufficiently long lived. So, uh, in a given tubulin uh, dimer, um, um, there is uh, eight tryptophans and some uh, a number of other uh, aromatic residue um, amino acids, uh, phenylalanine and tyrosine. There is 36 tyrosines, 42 phenylalanines shown here, um, distributed in the dimer like so. However, tryptophans are um, the most um, likely candidates to absorb uh, electromagnetic energy in the form of quanta at a near visible wavelengths, and they can emit them 
and uh, we are postulating or predicting that these interactions between tryptophans could involve I either um, resonant energy transfer in the form of the first the resonance or could be dipole-dipole interactions as we have um, discussed in previous work going back about a decade. What's interesting is that uh, there are similar um, pi, pi, um, pi ring, um, pi resonance ring um, arrangements in um, neurotransmitters and as well as psychedelics. So this, if this proven correct could uh, launch additional investigations uh, in terms of these uh, molecules affecting quantum interactions in microtubules and, um, and therefore affecting our mental states, if we can make that connection experimentally demonstrable. Uh, so this shows you um, the samples of microtubules and tubulin that um, Arad Kalra will be talking about um, where um, the presence of uh, 13 protofilament microtubules or 14 protofilament microtubules or depolymerized tubulin makes a huge difference in terms of interactions and potentially the lifetimes of these quantum excitations. If we demonstrate that they exist, as you will see in this, um, in this series of talks, we have strong indications that they do. Um, the second group of experiments, I, um, I would like to advertise for um, future discussion in this workshop is uh, the work of uh, the group of Professor Aristide Dogari from Uni the University of Central Florida on delayed luminescence in tubulin and microtubules. So we're looking at the same uh, systems, but subjected to different wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation and different time scale, as well as possibly um, length scales. In the second group, you'll see some very long lived um, absorption of uh, quantum energy um, from uh, photons in the visible range um, and the blue uh, wavelength. And, um, and, uh, and then separately, uh, Dr. Scholes and Dr. Um, Kara will um, discuss Tryptophan fluorescence and microtubules and tubulin, and, and I'm just uh, advertising these um, results, which uh, promise uh, some very interesting interpretations because the time scales are um, in the um, starting from single digit nanos nanosecond to tens of nanoseconds and and then delayed luminescence to hundreds of milliseconds and longer. Um, by the way, I want to um, bring back memories of some severe uh, criti critiques of Max Tegmark from about two decades ago, or um, our predictions of um, quantum excitation of microtubules on the order of milliseconds were uh, basically ridiculed in, in, his, uh, in his paper. And, and we um, countered that, that criticism with the, um, with the um, calculations showing that they can be actually, the excitations can be much, much longer lived. Uh, and now we are seeing this actually experimentally determined, um, whether this is due to shielding effects or, or some other um, yet unknown mechanisms it's still to be determined. Um, so here you see some snapshots of, of the results. And uh, Dr. Um, Kara, as well as Dr. Nagari and his team will be discussing those where we compare tubulin, um, uh, effects of tubulin in solution to that of buffer itself and microtubules. And then finally, microtubules with um, uh, with an anesthetic automatic and also some non-anesthetic molecules. And uh, I, finally, I want to mention to you the uh, computational predictions of uh, Travis Craddock and, and uh, Stuart Hammer and myself in earlier papers, which showed that 
um, resonant interactions between uh, tryptophans in, um, in the microtubule should be strongly affected by the presence of anesthetics, which, um, uh, which was demonstrated to correlate strongly with, um, with the potency of these anesthetic molecules as is shown here. Uh, the effects, however, may be, um, although uh, computationally um, quite striking, may be difficult to, uh, may be difficult to measure um, experimentally and uh, correlate with that. Anyway, at this point, I would like to um, turn uh, to Dr. Crowder, who, who is going to run the workshop in my absence. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm sure you'll be very interested to hear the talks that follow. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right, thank you to Dr. Tuzinski in absentia. That was a good overview of uh, what we're gonna see today. Just find my cursor on my screen here. Okay, so I'm going to be providing you some uh, a little bit more in depth in the uh, the theory that that underlies some of these experiments that we're going to be talking about today. Um, my name is Travis Craddock. I'm a professor at uh, Nova Southeastern University in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I work there in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience, uh, but my background is in physics. I trained under Dr. Dzinski um, from 2005 till I got my PhD in 2012, my master's and my PhD. Uh, from there, I went to work in the Department of Medicine at the University of Alberta, where I started to uh, work in the field of clinical systems biology. And then I took my position down at uh, Nova Southeastern, where I work at the Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine. Uh, and my job by day is to design uh, novel treatments for illnesses uh, with a neuroinflammatory component. And this work uh, falls under that um, purview because it has relation to um, uh, diseases that have dysfunctional microtubule cytoskeletons, such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease. Uh, this work uh, that I'm about to present has been funded by various sources, including uh, Nova Southeastern University, the Department of Defense, Army Research Office, and these are some of my collaborators that, um, that I've worked on with these projects, including uh, Dr. Hammerhoff, Dr. Dzinski, Dr. Daguerreau, um, uh, Robert Alfano, Ling Yang Shi from UCSD um, and CCNY. And I'd like to uh, give a shout out to the um, University of Miami computational platform that uh, we perform all of our, our experiments on. So in a nutshell, uh, what we're doing here, this is a quantum biology type experiment. So we have these ideas from uh, Dr. Penrose and Dr. Hammeroff, uh, stemming back from the, 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 the late 80s, early 90s. And what they're talking about is quantum effects, non-trivial quantum effects in a biological system. And for many years, they were proponents of this. And it wasn't until um, the mid 2000s where uh, Greg Engel's group out of the University of Chicago uh, Illinois Champaign, uh, they started uh, finding hallmarks of uh, quantum beating effects in photosynthetic units. And that, that work is really what propelled quantum biology into more of a mainstream uh, kind of field. Now, um, there's a, a paper by Jennifer Brooks that outlines the key aspects of a qu quantum biological process. And they all seem to in involve uh, the same thing. They're all processes that may be understood in terms of a rate, and they're all biosystems that contain some sort of pigment or small molecule that, uh, that interacts with the environment. And it's that pigment or small molecule that can exist in some sort of quantum state, either a superposition, uh, some sort of entanglement position. Even now we're hearing more about uh, ions, uh, which is, not, is an atom that's below a molecule, but, but existing in some sort of spin state. Um, so if, if all these systems can potentially exist in things like enzyme catalysis or olfaction or photosynthesis or magnetoreception in bird brain or bird eyes, why can it not exist in some place like the brain? So standard neuroscience, as you know, looks at the brain as a whole, but at what level do we want to look for things like consciousness? You know, do we look at the level of the whole brain? Do we look at the, uh, the level of, of uh, neural networks? Do we look at individual synapses? 
or do we go lower inside the neuron to look at individual molecular components? Uh, now, what we would argue is that you would have to go inside and that there are these processes that go on inside neurons that allow neurons to act the way that they do. And that these things can then propagate up to control overall brain behavior. So our area of choice, uh, as, as you heard, has been the microtubule cytoskeleton. Um, it forms the scaffold for a cell. Um, it, it does things like uh, uh, allows motor proteins to walk up and down the, um, the cell. It can direct uh, cargo traffic. It can decide where our uh, um, ions going to be, ion channels going to be placed within the cell, uh, where our messenger RNAs within vesicles, where are they delivered, which dendrite do they go to, which things do I send down to the end of the uh, axonal growth cone, and so forth. Um, other areas where people have looked for quantum effects in, in the brain have been things like ion channels. Um, however, we're going to argue that even ion channels, the, their overall function relies to some degree on the, the, the function of the microtubule cytoskeleton. So for example, here in um, the, the process of memory, which is known as uh, long-term uh, potentiation, where you strengthen the connection between uh, presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons, uh, that in, in some way, shape, or form is, is controlled by microtubule cytoskeleton. So not only does it it uh, uh, drive the, the direction and the location of where ion channels are placed, but by lengthening or decreasing the length of a dendritic spine, you can increase or decrease the proximity between postsynaptic and presynaptic neurons, and therefore you can, you can modulate the synaptic strength of the signal that's going between those neurons. Uh, little known is that um, almost every uh, ion channel is anchored within uh, your, your uh, lipid membrane in, in uh, lipid rafts. And these lipid rafts are anchored by a Geffrin scaffold, which is again connected to the microtubule cytoskeleton. So there have been experiments that show that if you disrupt the microtubule cytoskeleton, then you can cause dysfunction within, uh, within uh, ion channels. So for example, if you disrupt the microtubule cytoskeleton, you'll get a 78% reduction in uh, the GABA receptor current. And if you're in the field of consciousness, you know that GABA is, is a, a prime driver or, or one of the areas that, that um, individuals look at for, for uh, uh, conscious signaling. Um, hypoxia uh, uh, induced cytoskeletal reordering can suppress fast sodium channels within the cell, as well as there are drug induced uh, modifications of the microtubule cytoskeleton that can alter things like the calcium uh, channels within, within cells. As well, there's recent work by Rod Eckenhoff's group that shows that if uh, uh, patients are undergoing uh, taxane treatment, which is a microtubule uh, stabilizing agent, is that they require more anesthetic to, uh, to, uh, to be um, made unconscious than someone who is not uh, undergoing that, that taxane treatment. So this seems to point to the microtubule cytoskeleton as being a, a functional on-site um, uh, uh, location of anesthetic action. As I mentioned, um, um, these motor proteins, uh, kinesin and dynein, uh, to, name, to name two of them, are two, two families of motor proteins. They're little proteins that have legs that walk along the surface of a microtubule, and they carry these vesicles, uh, you know, big uh, um, uh, 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 containers full of uh, messenger RNA and proteins and, and building blocks of proteins, and they carry them along this microtubule cytoskeleton to different areas of the cell. Now, what has been shown uh, over the years is that these, these uh, motor proteins, as they walk, they read the surface of the microtubule uh, um, cytoskeleton, looking at each individual tubulin, uh, which is the protein that makes up a, a microtubule. And they can look at post-translational modifications on the surface of that microtubule and read those. So if they read a, an acetylation a marker or a phosphorylation marker or a tyrosination marker, it may indicate whether to release or to stay on or to follow a given path. So there is, is something that, that uh, more and more has been uh, um, being pointed out, something called the tubulin code. So we have the genetic code, and then we have a higher la layer up, which is known as the, uh, the tubulin code. Now, if we get specific, uh, the microtubule cytoskeleton is made up of a protein called tubulin. Tubulin is a heterodimer. It's made up of two parts, alpha tubulin and beta tubulin. You can see there on the left. And this peanut-shaped um, uh, protein, globular protein, has these two little C-terminal tails that stick up. And these two C-terminal tails are, are uh, very important for uh, the polymerization of the microtubule, as well as for interaction with other proteins. And there's a high degree of um, variability within the, the C-terminal tails. So you can get various 
isotypes of tubulin, uh, depending on which uh, body type or which uh, tissue type within the body you're looking at. So the brain has uh, particular isotypes of tubulin within it, whereas the kidney cells and your skin cells have other isotypes of tubulin, which means that all microtubules are not the same. Microtubules within the brain are gonna be different than microtubules within your skin or your butt, as which is a common uh, point that's made by uh, um, opponents of OrcoR. Now these uh, proteins, what they do is they stick together end to end to form this lateral thing called the protofilament. So this long strand of tubulin dimers and these tubulin uh, uh, protofilaments, they stick side to side in a shifted manner and then they wrap around to form a hollow tube called the, the microtubule. And this microtubule is on the order of 15 to 25 nanometers in diameter. So we're talking about a nanoscale structure. Now, if you look at these, these are almost exactly the same dimensions uh, as a nanomaterial known as a multi-walled carbon nanotube. So they're building these things out of graphene sheets. They wrap them up into, into tubes, and then they put different layers of graphene on top of, of it to, to make this hollow tube, which again ranges from one and a half to 15 uh, nanometer inner diameter to an outer diameter, di outer diameter of two and a half to 50 nanometers. So microtubules fall within this, in this range. Now they are studying these uh, carbon nanotubes, these multi-walled carbon nanotubes by various optical uh, techniques because they are an ideal uh, um, quantum mechanical um, uh, substrate. So you, you can have these, these um, uh, multi-walled carbon nanotubes as potential um, uh, uh, sensors, as potential um, sites for potentially even quantum uh, computation. And so they're looking at what kind of properties these things have these things have these nanoelectronics or nanophotonics of these uh, carbon nanotubes. Uh, so it has been a goal in, um, in, um, in biotechnology to use these carbon nanotubes as biomimetics for microtubules. So if you take a car multi-walled carbon nanotube and you put it within a cell, you can, uh, you can have it um, increase assembly of microtubules. You can have it potentially act as a, a prosthetic for uh, degraded uh, microtubules within a, uh, something like a, um, a degrading Alzheimer's neuron and so forth. But that's one aspect is, is using uh, a technology to mimic biology. And what, one thing that we're proposing is that we should be looking at what we have for current technology and using those techniques to measure current biology. So that's one thing that, that, that has been kind of an impetus for this type of work is to use the type of techniques that they're looking at in these uh, nanomaterials and apply them to study things like the microtubule cytoskeleton. Now in specific, uh, what we're gonna be talking about is the small molecules that we're gonna be interested in is aromatic amino acids. Uh, and how these things can be potentially uh, sites for uh, processes such as uh, excitons, uh, for things like super radiance, uh, and as well as for things like uh, phanoresonance. And I'm gonna get into that in a little bit. But first, uh, what are aromatics? Aromatics are uh, nonpolar uh, amino acids that um, they prefer to be in, in hydrophobic regions of the protein, and they contain this, this aromatic ring structure. And we've heard about uh, uh, tryptophan, there's also tyrosine and phenylalanine, and the lesser known one is, is histidine. Uh, but the one that we're, we're primarily interested in is tryptophan. One, because tryptophan is one of the most highly conserved uh, amino acids within, within biology. It, it, in order to create tryptophan, there's a, a large energetic demand. So the reason to have it within a, a protein structure, there has to be an importance to have it in there if, you, if you're using a lot of energy to create it and put it in there. Likewise, because it's, it's being conserved over, over many uh, different types of proteins, um, you know, if, as you go through, through the evolutionary tree, it is also something that, that is very, very important in, in that regard. Um, if we're looking at the photo uh, um, properties of tryptophan, it has a very large transition dipole moment. So when it gets excited by a photon, uh, all the, as it absorbs the energy of the, the photon, the electrons in that, um, in that aromatic amino acid, they shift to a, to a new position and it ca causes the atoms within the, the protein, or sorry, within the um, aromatic amino acid to move very slightly. And that shift as it moves from, you know, the ground state to its first excited state sets up what's known as a transition dipole moment. And the transition dipole moment of tryptophan is fairly high. It's on the order of six to five, 
which is comparable to something like chlorophyll within um, within your photosynthetic light harvesting system. And that is what, what uh, our, uh, kind of drove our curiosity of, well, if you can have that kind of system, uh, 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 light harvesting system within photosynthesis, maybe there's a similar kind of process that's going on within biology. And so that drove us to start looking at uh, the tryptophan um, aromatic amino acid network. But in biology with plants, you have the source of the sun that can come down and illuminate those plants. What is the source of light within a cell? You wouldn't expect there to be light within your brain. However, there, there is to a degree, it is very weak. It is not, it's not of the order of the sun. It's not even of the order of the light that we're seeing here, but there's a weak uh, low level endogenous light that's being generated due to oxidative uh, metabolism within, within the cell. So as you generate ATP in mitochondria, there's a process which uh, generates a reactive oxygen species. And to clear away those reactive oxygen species, the radical recombination process can result what, in what is known as uh, electronically excited species. So as it goes through the process of, of getting rid of those radicals, what you, you end up with is a, a, um, a molecule that is in an excited state. And when that, that state relaxes down to its ground state, it can emit a photon of energy. Now, the one that we're interested in specifically is not so much the emission of the photon, but the transfer of the photon through non-radiative means. So you can excite something like a carbonyl group within, uh, within a protein, and then that energy can then be transferred as long as it shares uh, um, an energy level uh, comparable to that of tryptophan, which in this case, a, a triple carbonyl group does. It can transfer the energy to the uh, tryptophan aromatic amino acid network within a protein. Here, we're gonna be talking specifically about the, the microtubule cytoskeleton. So this again is uh, tubulin on the left. And those little blue blobs, those are the tryptophans that are in, in, in an individual tubulin. On the right, we strip away the rest of the protein and you can see each individual uh, uh, tryptophan molecule. Uh, and now those are the distances between each of the uh, um, tryptophan um, in angstrom. Now, if we look at how strongly these things are coupled looking at dipole-dipole interactions, uh, we get this kind of uh, drawing here. Now, what we can see is, is that the strength, uh, as indicated by the size and thickness of the arrows, what we have is basically three uh, doublets of tryptophan molecules that go across, that span across the um, a single tubulin uh, protein. Now, when these things are stuck end to end um, in a microtubule, this thing repeats over and over and over again down the length of the uh, protofilament. And then there's a different uh, geometry and pattern if you're looking at the helix of the, of the microtubule, which I'll, I'll discuss a little bit later. So we, uh, we looked at this, this coupling um, um, network and then applied the same techniques that they did to the, the photosynthetic uh, system that they, they, they've been studying um, you know, for decades. Uh, but, but which really had the, the quantum description of that in the, in the early 2000s. So we came along and we, we applied the same sort of uh, uh, modeling technique and then compared our results to experiment. And we found very good uh, agreement with certain set of parameters. So remember in, in any sort of model, you're gonna have some free parameters that you don't know what the answer are, but you can pick some plausible ranges. And we took those plausible ranges and then used that to calculate out what the uh, experimental spectra of tubulin looks like. So up in the top there, we have the, the uh, um, absorption spectra. Uh, the bottom left is we have the circular dichroism spectra. And on the right, we have the linear dichroism spectra. And we found that given a good set of parameters, we had uh, a good agreement with, with experiment. And then using those parameters, we simulated what would happen if you excited a single tryptophan within that network. And we, we evolved this according to uh, Schrodinger's equation using a model called the Hock and Strobel model, where it has some, some disorder within the, the energetics of the individual tryptophan to mimic uh, the interaction with the thermal bath or the environment. And um, what we found is, is that if you excite um, these, these um, individual tryptophan, what you can get is that characteristic quantum beating effect that they were observing in the FMO uh, complex. And this was the hallmark of quantum biology for photosynthesis. And we're seeing the same sort of uh, process that's going on within an individual tubulin uh, uh, dimer. 
So what we suspect is that if we propagate this out to larger and larger systems, such as an entire microtubule, that potentially we could get uh, um, absorption of the energy and transfer of the energy along the microtubule structure. So here is a section of the microtubule um, surface uh, with nine uh, tryptophan molecules in, in what's known as a B-lattice conformation. And if we strip away again the protein, what we see are these channels of tryptophan. So very dense along the length of the protofilament with sparseness as you go around the, 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 the circumference of the microtubule. So we wanted to see, well, if we could have this sort of process of energy transfer within a single tubulin, what would happen if we simulated the effect of that excitation traveling along the length of a protofilament? And so in, in the uh, uh, mid 2010, so around 2017, uh, uh, Philip Curian and I, we looked at this and we simulated the effect of a single excitation being transferred along a single protofilament. And again, we had many free parameters. So we, we looked at all of them. And depending on the parameters chosen, uh, you can get anywhere from that excitation sitting within a single tubulin dimer or transferring up to 12 dimers away from the initial, from the initial site of, of um, absorption. Now, again, you know, we, we need to look further into these parameters and see what is ideal, but we're gonna hear some work from Arat Kalra later, which can give us a, an estimate of which one of these parameter sets is, is the most ideal. Now, what you can see here as well is that this process is not symmetric. So you can see that, 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 that those uh, uh, distances are actually right shifted. And so that means that it has a preferred direction on, on which, which way it wants to travel along the microtubule. And so because this is a semi-stochastic process, because there is, is this direction, it means that there's something in the way that the energetics are set up within tubulin to drive it in a, in a given direction. So overall, this idea then is that within a neuron, you have uh, microtubules, which are within neurons, they're always surrounded by uh, mitochondria. There's a, a relationship where mitochondria and microtubules within neurons, they co-localize so that uh, uh, microtubules, they, they shuttle mitochondria around using those, those motor proteins. Uh, and uh, they can also uh, uh, control things like mitochondrial fission or fusion. There's a lot of these dynamics that go on with mitochondria that rely upon the microtubule set of skeleton. Now, because the mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell and they're generating the ATP required for, for cellular energetics, they're the prime source of reactive oxygen species within the, within the, the cell. These reactive oxygen species, as I said, they produce uh, electronically excited species. In this case, you can see these reactive oxygen species exciting a triplet carbonyl group on some protein. And then that energy can then be transferred to the tubulin uh, aromatic amino acid network, which then signals down the length of the, the microtubule. And this can be some sort of either signaling me mechanism where it's picked up later on down in the cell to let farther areas of the cell kind of know what's going on uh, in, in different areas of the cell, or it can be driving some sort of process that energy can be harvested later on to be used for some purpose. Um, or it can be read maybe by motor proteins that are walking along the surface of the cell of, oh, this is a very dangerous area because there's a whole bunch of, of reactive oxygen species here. Let's avoid that. It, it, this is all speculation, of course, but, but there are mechanisms that, that could use this, this type of uh, energy or signaling to influence overall behavior of the neuron. One such site could be, for example, influencing receptor dynamics. Here, for example, is uh, again, the GABA receptor. Now GABA has its own um, network of tryptophan uh, uh, residues within it. Uh, you can see here that uh, on the top, that's the outer membrane. And on the, um, on the bottom, that's the inner membrane where the bottom is, is to the inside of the, of the cell. And you can see a very rich region of, of tryptophan molecules there on the inside of the cell. Now, if you remember, we have that kind of scaffolding uh, the Geffrin scaffolding that attaches to GABA and then the microtubule cytoskeleton. So it's potent, there's a potential that that energy could be transferred directly to things like GABA. And it's been shown that UV irradiation can significantly potentiate GABA-induced currents. So we could have that, that this signaling by ROS from mitochondria can then be transferred to things like ion channels that can then change the way that they function within the cell. Now this is all, again, speculative, but it's an area that we should be looking at at least I think. 
So that's uh, that's kind of the background for um, for looking at aromatic amino acids, and we're going to hear from from some experimentalists later about what they have found looking at these these systems. Uh, but I want to go a little bit further about some of the, the the more recent work that we've done looking at these um, at these networks. So back in uh, 2018, I was working with uh, Philip Curdy, Curian and Lucas Lardo. And Luca did a lot of work again with photosynthetic systems. And he was looking at things like uh, super radiance. So super radiance is um, it's something that can occur when the wavelength of excitation is much longer than the, than the absorbers of the excitation um, or, or the network that's absorbing the excitation. So here we can see the length of a microtubule or, or the approximate length of a microtubule that would fit within one wavelength of the, uh, um, of the photon that's required to excite uh, a tryptophan, which is around 280 nanometers. Now, what happens when you, when you do this is, is you're not just exciting one of the tryptophan, but you're collectively exciting all of them all at once, and they behave in a collective fashion. And this, this, this uh, joint behavior, as they function as a single uh, entity, can give rise to things like enhanced decay rate, which is many, many times faster than, um, than it is uh, normal and a spontaneous emission uh, that, that, is, um, that is stronger than any in individual emitter. So it's a hallmark of super radiance. So you have this thing where you, you're kind of absorbing this energy and then it's kind of pulsing out this strong um, uh, signal that you would not get from an individual, individual emitter. Now that's, that's super radiance and I don't have a slide for this next thing, but it's related to super radiance, which is known as subradiance. And so there, there's uh, um, a, a different state that can occur where it absorbs the energy and rather than, than emitting it in these strong pulses, it actually holds on to it and stores it for a long length of time compared to what you would get for a single individual emitter. So for example, tryptophan, uh, uh, the singlet excitation of tryptophan emits on the order of nanoseconds. Uh, but in, in the case of say something like a subradiant uh, state of a tryptophan network, this could last much, much longer. I'm not, I don't know, I'm not gonna give estimates, but it could be longer than nanoseconds, maybe into microseconds. Um, I, don't, I don't know the exact modeling, but it is longer than the individual emitter. So that's what uh, uh, Luca, uh, um, Dr. Salardo, Dr. Karina and myself did. Um, uh, Dr. Salardo provided the, the uh, uh, mathematical description, which is a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, which allows uh, interaction of these excitations either between the tryptophan molecules as well as interacting with uh, the external environment. And then that, that excitation can then be, you know, shared among the tryptophan molecules or it can be returned to the environment and then reabsorbed and so forth. On the left, what we see is an individual ring of the tubulin, or sorry, of the microtubule helix. And so that's one tubulin dimer long and 13 um, uh, tubulin around. And because the microtubule is an achiral, sorry, is a, sorry, is a chiral uh, uh, protein polymer, it, it, it has a left-handed helical symmetry. And so it's, it wraps around as it goes up. Um, uh, and so th this is something that, uh, that is also very interesting in, in terms of the, the, the structure of, of tubulin or of microtubules. Now in modeling this, uh, we started out, we, we look at what is the collective ex excitation of a single spiral of tryptophan uh, molecules within that, that microtubule geometry. And then we would add uh, additional spirals. So we go one, two, three, four, five, and these are the results. And what you're seeing on, on the, the y-axis there is the reorganization energy uh, versus the, uh, the energy of, of, the, um, of the state. And what, what, what you want for super radiance is for you to have a, an individual um, uh, state that is the lowest possible energy that has the highest uh, possible um, reorganization energy. Um, so what you can see here is initially all those points are kind of smattered across the different energy levels and there's no one clear one that, that stands out. Uh, but as you start to get to, to areas like say 10 spirals, you can see that on the far left, uh, you have that one that's standing out at about uh, negative 100 up at um, uh, uh, gamma over gamma of, of 150. And then as we add more spirals, so at 100 spirals, this becomes very, very strong. So what we're getting is, is a, a very strong uh, super radiant state within the system, the longer you make your microtubule. Uh, that red graph there is showing uh, the number of super radiant states 
as you increase the, the number of spirals within the system. And you can see that the, the number of super radiant states uh, initially starts out very high. So you don't have one clear winner, but as you start to add more and more and more, eventually you get to a point where there's only one state. And that occurs around 13 uh, uh, spirals. We don't know if there's a significance related to 13 spirals and 13 protofilaments wrapping around. We're not sure about that, but indeed this is the case. Uh, that, that this is where we start to see at least five the, this theoretical modeling that we have this one super radiant state. Now, uh, you know, in talking with reviewers, they, they they wanted to ask, you know, is it is it something to do with the fact that you're repeating the same tubulin molecule over and over and over again, so you have this high degree of symmetry? So what we did was we completely randomly oriented every single tryptophan molecule within the system, uh, so that they were pointing in, in directions that weren't even allowed biologically. So tryptophan can only, you know, take on so many conformations within the protein. And that means that the, the, the dipole moment can only take so many conformations, but we were allowing it to take whatever, whatever direction it wanted. Uh, and you can see there in the, in the lower left that it completely washes everything out. So what that means is that in order to have this super radiant state is that the structure of tryptophan uh, within the, the microtubule has to be organized and it has to uh, deal with the biology in some way. And so if we go over there to the bottom right, here's where we partially randomize the system. So in this case, again, there was some non-biological directions, but they were repeated over and over again. So there was, uh, there was a degree of, of symmetry within the system. And you can see that it starts to get more structure within, the, within, the, um, within, within these states here. So our, our contention is that the, the structure and geometry of the microtubule cytoskeleton is such that it can give rise to these super radiant states. Now, so here's a simulation of a single excitation along the surface of, of a microtubule. On the top, that is looking at uh, the most super radiant state. Uh, and those uh, uh, colors are indicating the probability of finding the excitation within that area. So you can see that it, it, it highly uh, centralizes or, or, you know, in the middle of the microtubule and then it kind of tapers off at the end, which is expected. But then if you look on the right there, you can see that, that it's mostly concentrated on the outside of the microtubule cytoskeleton. Whereas the tryptophan on the inside, on the lumen of the microtubule, it's very, very low probability that you're gonna find that excitation. However, if you look at the most subradiant state or the highest subradiant state, that's on the bottom, you'll notice that there's hardly any state or probability of finding that subradiant state on the outside, but you can find it to, to a high degree with on the inside. So there's, there's kind of this interplay between the emitting states are on the outside of the microtubule, whereas the storage states are more on the inside of the microtubule. So there's a potential for some sort of uh, um, um, place where they can, can store that excitation within the, within the lumen of the microtubule. Okay. Just wanna see how we're doing on time here. Give me one second. Okay, I have a few more minutes here. All right, uh, finally, I wanted to discuss, uh, this is a recent paper I did with uh, uh, Robert Alfano at uh, City College of New York and Ling Yang Shi of uh, University of California, San Diego. Uh, and they're, they're, they're very much into optics and using optical techniques to, to study uh, uh, new materials, uh, to find uh, biosensors or new imaging techniques uh, in biology. So they use things like, uh, Raman spectroscopy and looking for signatures of biomolecules and how they change under, under various conditions. Uh, and I actually met uh, Robert Alfano here at this meeting uh, many years ago, and we've been collaborating ever since. Uh, and he was interested in something called phanoresonance, partially because of its importance to, um, in uh, technology as well. Uh, his name is Alfano and he, he liked the name Fano. So <laughs> that, that's, that's an aside. But uh, what, what final resonance is, is, is when you're looking at um, uh, spectral properties in light, um, you get the, this kind of absorption peak. So I showed, showed it for you for, uh, for tryptophan earlier. We, were, we had this peak. And traditionally, when you're looking at these, we, we assume that they are, are Gaussian in shape, Gaussian or Lorentzian, which is, which, which is to say it's a symmetric line shape. Is you have this peak in the middle, this width, and then it tapers off on both sides to the same degree. Now, 
what you can have is, is that if there is some sort of interaction between that excitation, in, in this case, we're gonna be talking about uh, a Raman spectroscopy. So that's uh, exciting the vibrational modes of, of, uh, of a, a system, in this case of proteins, and looking at how those vibrational modes um, are set up with that given excitation. And so in this case, we're looking at, at how those vibrations are set up. And if, it, if it's symmetric, you're just looking at, at the regular vibration. However, if those uh, vibrational modes are also coupled to a continuum of states, in this case, electronic states, that coupling between vibrational modes and electronic modes, which is something you can only get through a quantum mechanical coupling, it can give rise to what's known as a Fano resonance, which is an asymmetrical line shape within the, within the, within the spectra. And so uh, what I show here is your traditional um, uh, Lorentzian, which is shown in red. Uh, and then uh, the description describing a, a Fano line shape. And that, that is the equation there given on the right. Um, now, if the parameter, the coupling between uh, uh, that, that vibrational state and that electronic state is very, very, um, is very, very large, you don't get the effect, okay? I'm oh, sorry, is it very, very small? And so as you, um, as you decrease that, that Q parameter, which is called the Fano parameter, you're actually increasing uh, the coupling. And what you're gonna get is more and more of a symmetric line shape. So the, the degree of, of uh, asymmetry within that system gives you a measure of how strong or how weak the, uh, the system is coupled. This has been something that has been observed in carbon nanotubes. And that is why it's something that we wanted to look at, uh, looking at it in, in microtubules. So like I was saying, uh, a Raman scattering is where you, you send in a pulse of light and it's absorbed by a molecule setting up vibrational modes within the system. And then it can re-emit that light and it can re-emit it in three ways. It can emit it at the exact same frequency and that's known as rally scattering. Uh, it can emit it at a, um, at a uh, greater um, um, uh, wavelength. So it's so a longer wavelength and that's known as uh, Stokes Raman scattering or can emit it at a, at a shorter wavelength, and that's known as the anti-Stokes. And here we're gonna be talking about that, that Stokes-Raman shift. So what we did is we illuminated uh, tubulin samples both in a, in a dry state, so dry powdered tubulin and dry powdered microtubules, uh, and in a, an aqueous state, so in solution. And we uh, illuminated with a 532 nanometer um, uh, laser, and then we measured back the light that's being, being emitted from the, from the sample. Uh, this was done by uh, Ling Yang Shi's group at UCSD. These are the experimental methods. Um, I'm not going to go into these, but if you're interested, you can take a snapshot of the screen. And these are the typical spectra that we get back. And so each individual one of these peaks here is corresponding to a different vibrational mode within the protein. Uh, the solution is, is in red. The dry uh, state is in, is in black. I'm only showing microtubules in this case. Uh, if you want to, if you want to see tubulin uh, individually, you can look at the paper, uh, which I can provide you a uh, citation with later. Uh, and each of these individual peaks, because they're they're corresponding to a, a given vibrational mode, you can assign them to what vibrational mode they're they're um, they, they correspond to. So we have a, a very very strong peak, which is is due to some uh, disulfide bond, a carbon sulfur stretching. You can see that there, just just below 700 uh, uh, Raman shift or inverse centimeters. Uh, as well as you can see there, there's a lot of aromatic amino acid uh, vibrational modes in there within this given uh, uh, energy range. Uh, so, so many of the peaks, uh, they belong to, you know, AMI-3 vibrations, disulfide bonds, as well as phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. Uh, when we shift from the dry state to the wet state, uh, we, we basically get the same number of peaks. However, the, 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 the um, the peak um, location is can be shifted by a few uh, uh, inverse centimeters, uh, not, not very much, but it does get shifted due to the aqueous environment, as well as the strength of the intensity seems to increase as you put it into a, an aqueous environment. And that's most likely due to the fact that, you know, when it's dry, it's fairly rigid, where it's, when it's, it's solvated, it can, can vibrate more, more freely. Uh, then what we did was, is we applied that Fano line shape to each individual peak within the system, not in isolation. That's generally what people do is they say, oh, I want to look at, you know, the peak at 700 inverse centimeters, and they cut away the rest of the spectra, and they look just at that one, and they apply a peak to that. 
and a nice symmetric peak. What we did is we looked at the entire spectra, even beyond what you see here on the screen. We looked beyond it. We used a program to find out where the individual peaks were. And then we put one of these um, uh, Lorentzian envelopes over each one of those peaks. And then we varied the parameters of each one of those peaks. So we, we varied the height of the peak, we varied the width of the peak, and then the Thano coupling of the peak. And we did that over you know, 40,000 iterations each time. And we tried to do that and varied those parameters to find the most optimal fit for the, for the system. And in doing so, uh, you know, we, we started with one peak then we went to two peaks and three peaks and four peaks and so on, going uh, down the, the, um, the, the most prominent peak to the next prominent peak and so forth. And we evaluated which model was the best model using the Akeki uh, information criterion to find out what is the best way to describe this system using, using uh, uh, this, this uh, modeling um, function. And what we found was is that certain peaks preferred to be described using this asymmetric uh, uh, Fano line shape. And of those peaks, these are the ones here. Uh, we found a, one with a, a disulfide bond, uh, several tyrosine, and se several tryptophan, as well as uh, some amide 3 and just general carbon uh, hydrogen stretching. Now, what, what this, this seems to indicate is that there's a degree of coupling between the vibrational modes within the protein, at least in these aromatics and disulfide bonds, and their electronic states. Uh, so this is something that, that, that is only, can only happen if there's some sort of quantum uh, uh, interaction. And it, it can be evidence or taken as, as a piece of evidence to indicate that there may be a, um, some sort of quantum uh, aspect of tryptophan excitations, either vibrationally or electronic, that can be uh, modified to, to give rise to certain effects. So if you, if you look in the literature on um, nanomaterials and metamaterials, there's, there's a wealth of information on how to manipulate these parameters with phano resonance to give rise to stronger couplings or weaker couplings for given electronic uh, uh, effects. Okay, now we, we heard about uh, uh, Jack, we had mentioned the, the theory of, of uh, uh, ORCOR and its relation to uh, anesthesia. So this is, is something that, that Stuart uh, Hammerhoff had come up with uh, many years ago. Uh, it was uh, termed quantum mobility theory. And the idea here is that, you know, if you look at a microtubule and then down to, you know, a lattice of tubulin dimers and then an individual tubulin dimers and then with inside at the individual aromatic amino acids is that they can set up this, these dipole oscillations. And that, that is our, our current uh, understanding of what is the best candidate for a qubit within um, within tubulin. And if you have these dipole oscillations, whether they are, you know, van der Waals oscillations in, in one way, shape or form, or they are these um, uh, electronically excited uh, dipole oscillations, which I've been talking about. These are two different areas, but they are, they are similar in that they are oscillating dipoles in one way, shape or form. Is that our, the idea is that you can have these, these anesthetic molecules can come in and they can damp that oscillation. And if they remove that oscillation, they would remove the either the collective behavior of the system, the transfer of energy within the system, or, or some other mechanism that we were not quite aware of yet. Now, what do we know about anesthetics and how they act? Uh, we do know that, that anesthetics do not share a structural similarity. So we can have things like uh, sevoflurane, which is many molecules. Uh, we can look at the intravenous uh, anesthetics, which are quite large molecules. We can go down to a single atom such as xenon. Uh, so th they, they, they don't share any structural similarity in, um, in the way that they, way, that, way that they look or any sort of chemical similarity if you look at their, their functional groups and so forth. Uh, they also span a 35 fold range in molecular volume from xenon uh, up to you know, your, your steroid type uh, anesthetics. And so we don't know <laughs> what, what, it, what is shared among these, among these uh, molecules, except for one thing. And that is, is that their, um, their potency as an anesthetic correlates highly with their solubility in oil, in olive oil. So they prefer to be in a hydrophobic environment. Uh, and this is something that, that you know, uh, Stuart has you know, been a proponent of and has pointed out to me and it made, made me aware of it uh, many years ago. Um, now, if you look at uh, what we show here, 
Uh, this is, uh, uh, on the left, this is your Meyer-Overton correlation. So on the bottom, you have your um, uh, anesthetic potency or your minimum alveolar concentration required to induce anesthesia. And on the left, you have the solubility in, in olive oil. And down the diagonal there, those are all various uh, anesthetic molecules. And you can see that they follow that nice linear trend. Now, far over on the right over there, those are two uh, molecules, which by all, uh, um, you know, all things that we know, they should act as anesthetics, okay? But they are non-anesthetics. They, they induce convulsions and they don't, they, don't put, they don't knock you out. But according to their minimum, or sorry, according to their solubility in olive oil, where that dotted line is joining with that, uh, the black line, they should have that uh, constant, they should be able to act as a, an anesthetic at that concentration. But all the way up to a thousand MAC, uh, a thousand percent atmosphere, they, they will not act as, a, as an anesthetic. So they're, they're kind of these outliers. Now, one of the other things that, that you know, I was interested in, I was looking at how these, uh, these anesthetics could manipulate these dipole oscillations within a microtubule. So I started looking at a, a physical property of theirs called uh, polarizability. So how freely do the electrons move uh, within, that, within that molecule? And so that's what's shown on the left, or sorry, on the right there. Polarizability is now on the, the y-axis. And again, uh, MAC is shown on the bottom. And you can see a general shift uh, in the, in the um, anesthetics. However, their order is, um, is completely lined up. So it's the same rank order on the left and the right for those, for those anesthetics. But if you look, the, the two non-anesthetics, they shift. So their, their polarizability and their uh, solubility in olive oil do not share the same relation uh, that um, the anesthetics do. So if we plot solubility or versus polarizability, we find out that, that anesthetics, again, follow this nice linear trend, whereas these non-anesthetics actually fall off that line. And so this was... Uh, you know, our proposition that in order for it to be an anesthetic, it has to have both the, the, the solubility uh, uh, within olive oil or solubility within a hydrophobic region, as well as a polarizability that falls along this curve. Now, polarizability is, you know, that, like I said, the degree of which electrons move. And solubility is the, um, is the uh, uh, how well or how, how much does it want to hide within a hydrophobic pocket. And this can have implications for how strongly a molecule docks or, or how, how strongly it can find a given hydrophobic region within a, within a protein. And so what we're suggesting here is that, that these non-anesthetics may not have that property. So what we did was, is we uh, performed a docking simulation where we took all of these mo molecules and uh, calculated out their, their energy of binding to tubulin within no, uh, uh, predicted sites of anesthetic binding uh, on the tubulin molecule. And then we calculated out how do those anesthetics affect the natural oscillation of the aromatic amino acid network within, within tubulin. And what you see here on the bottom is a shift in frequency. So those gray lines are the, uh, the natural modes of oscillation between every single one of the aromatics within tubulin and um, in, in the absence of anesthetics. Now, if you add in a, a, the anesthetic, one thing it does is it adds an additional uh, a mode of, of uh, vibration. And those are those colored lines for each of those um, anesthetics as well as for the two um, non-anesthetics. And you can see the non-anesthetics are over there on the, on the left at a, at a lower frequency, whereas the higher uh, frequencies have, have, have the anesthetics. Uh, as well as it takes those little gray lines and shifts it very, very slightly. But you can't see that here. That's not shown here because you can't see it on the, on the scale. So if we again go and look at that, those individual shifts, uh, we can see that the individual shifts are all downshifted by each one of the, uh, the anesthetics. And if you look at the degree to which that peak is shifted or downshifted, I'll, I'll show you a relation uh, to that later. So you can see that, you know, desflurane has something uh, just above 600, diethyl ether as well, enflurane, halothane, all of the anesthetics have this downward shift right above 600 um, uh, terahertz. So that's the, 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 the location where the peak originally existed, was right around 600 uh, terahertz. 
Uh, and then on the on the y-axis, that's degree the degree by which that peak is shifted in the gigahertz range. And you can so you can see here some of these are being shifted by negative 50, negative 20 uh, hertz. So you're taking that 600 and you're going or slightly above 600 going slightly down. So maybe from 600 down to 580 or something like that. But the non-anesthetics, the F6 and the TFMB, they the TFMB shows an upward uh, shift at that uh, at that frequency, where, whereas uh, the F6 also has a slightly upward shift there, uh, but it has a downward shift lower down, well below the 600 uh, terahertz. So there seems to be some sort of relation here. So if we plot that shift of the of the the natural mode around 600 hertz uh, against the minimum alveolar concentration to cause anesthesia, we get this curve here, and we get this nice curve here showing that the anesthetics all line up on this uh, um, uh, um, uh, logarithmic curve here, I'm oh, sorry, this, this power curve here, and that the, the non-anesthetics actually fall in line with where that curve should be. So in order for something to act like an anesthetic, it would have to be you know, at, that, uh, at the level of where nitrous oxide is or to the left, okay? Anything beyond that, you're gonna be going to, to higher and higher concentrations, uh, or, or higher and higher atmospheres where you're not going to generate that that um, that anesthetic effect. So the idea now is that potentially these anesthetics can then act by blocking those collective oscillations within the aromatic amino acid network. And that's kind of the theory that we wanted to test with these experiments that you're going to be hearing. So in conclusion, microtubules are key structures that are capable of modulating uh, receptor and ion channel activity, as well as influencing synaptic plasticity. Uh, changes to their structure, either via post-translational or uh, post -translational modifications, uh, electrostatic changes, such as uh, with excitations, they can affect motor protein transfer, transport and potentially uh, overall neuron function. Um, aromatic amino acids within the microtubule network can serve as a site for excitation or exciton transport, absorption and transport, potential super radiance and phanoresonant effects. Uh, modeling predicts that anesthetics may disrupt these types of processes by uh, uh, destroying collective effects within the system. Uh, but further modeling and experiments uh, are needed to look further at, at other um, effects that are going on within the microtubule cytoskeleton. Uh, and now I'm, I'm uh, here's some references here that I, I pointed out. And I'm happy to take a few questions before uh, Rat uh, comes on to talk about his very exciting experiments. Thank you. Just a microphone. Testing. Can you hear me? Can you comment on what's going on between the radiance inside the microtubule versus outside of it? Okay, so if you didn't hear that, can, can I comment on the, uh, the radiance going on outside the microtubule versus the in, inside the microtubule, uh, those, those super radiant and subradiant states? Short answer, no. <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I mean, we, we need to look at it further. I mean, the, the, these, are, uh, these are models. Um, it's very interesting, these effects that, that you, know, you find the super radiant state on the outside and a subradiant state on the inside. Uh, why that is, I'm not quite sure. I think it has to do with the um, strength of coupling. If you remember that uh, diagram of the aromatics that I had with all the red arrows, you'll see that it's, it's the, tube, uh, the tryptophan on the outside of the microtubule that are all strongly coupled, whereas those ones on the inside are very weakly coupled. And so I think it has to do with the, the weak coupling between the outside and the inside where it makes it uh, more ideal for storage. So weaker coupling means that they're, they're not likely to interact with the, with the rest of the network and therefore they're less likely to transfer on or, or, or get rid of that excitation. So a follow-up, any idea why the coupling is different? Oh yeah, I mean, the coupling is different because of just the, the geometry of the system. They're farther away. Uh, from the rest of the the, uh, the network, so they all they all share the same strength of the the dipoles, the, the transition dipole, within you know uh, you know few units. Uh, they're, they're not exactly the same, uh, but the distance between them, which which affects how strongly they couple. So very close, they'll strongly couple. Very far away, there'll be practically no coupling. So because they're farther away, they just don't interact as much.
Do we have someone at the back? Have, have any of these uh, models been put into uh, a, a computational framework, um, such as uh, modifying attenual networks to, to uh, uh, account for uh, the dipoles within uh, tubules as a metaphor for a, uh, an activation within a neural network? In a neural network? Have, they, have, they, have people taken this into a computational environment? I mean, I, I mean, all, all these experiments have been in a computational environment. All, all of these were simulated uh, experiments. So that one where it shows the excitation kind of shifting to the right, right. that was, you can see the, I have, I have videos I didn't show today, but you can see the excitation hopping down the length of the microtubule. So, so I mean, the, these are simulated uh, uh, results. And have they uh, been confirmed in, in wet biology? Uh, we're going to hear about that a little bit later. I won't comment on that because I'm not an experimentalist, but I'll leave it to the experimentalists to talk about. Got it, thanks. Uh, right behind him. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, I just had a quick question about, um, you spoke about specific configurations for, I think it was microtubules being like 13 something in a group of something. And then there was a set of some emitters producing this super radiance. I was just wondering, could you like clarify those details for me? Just so I could get yeah, so, okay, so, of, like, the, the, I guess, a scaled picture of where that single state was achieved. Sorry, which, which image are we talking about? There is, you're, te it, I believe you're testing out different configurations of structures for microtubules um, of different numbers of. Oh, with, with the spirals, yeah, is it yeah. something like this? Around here? Say that again. Okay. Yeah, yeah, this. Uh, so th I saw this was possibly like a cross section of one of them, but for the bigger group, is there a large group where you're applying these excitations to, and this is just one inside of the group to get? Yeah, so th resonance? this is the entire. Uh, this is the maximum uh, uh, microtubule. So, so uh, you can't see it here, but each those those are little spheres, and each of those little spheres is a um, is a tryptophan molecule. So, and that's, I believe it's a hundred tubulin dimers long. We're talking about 800, um, you know, it's a it's hundred dimers long. So it's 800 for individual protofilm. So 800 times 13 as it goes around. That's how many we're seeing here. And we've just, we've just squished it down so that we can actually view it. So for this simulation cell, I mean, like what was inside of it? Was it just like, this is what you see? Just it? this, just the tryptophan, just, just tryptophan molecules. Okay, and there, this isn't a cross section, this is like the actual- cube. This is the whole microtubule, yeah. Okay, Yeah, gotcha. exactly. Now, I, I think I, I'll be happy to answer questions later on. We're gonna have a panel discussion later. Uh, so save your questions, but we need to move on to uh, Iraq cholera. So just a, a little introduction. Uh, Dr. Kalra is a postdoctoral scientist in the Scholes Group at Princeton University. He is an expert on microtubules and works to determine the feasibility of excitonic tr energy transport within uh, these biological nanowires. Uh, he has previously worked out with approaches from both physics and biology to determine the relevance of physical interactions in biological systems. And exp his experiments have shown that the electrostatic behavior of microtubules is solvent dependent and can re uh, regulate the local chemical environment. Thank you. Um, thank you for that introduction uh, and that talk, uh, Dr. Paddock. Um, uh, I'm Arat Kalra. Can, can everyone hear me? Hi, can can. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome. All right, so um, this talk uh, is designed as an, as an update uh, to, to, the, to, the, uh, to tell you all about what's been going on um, in the, in the ORCOR experiments uh, end of things. So Dr. Craddock's talk, uh, showed us some uh, really cool simulations. Uh, my talk will be the opposite. It will be um, about experiments, okay? 
Um, like I said, um, this is an update to the Templeton project. Um, so very grateful to be funded by the Templeton World Charity Forum. Um, this project is, um, it's now getting to the point where it's being written up to form a paper, which um, I hope um, will be up on the archive or be published um, in the next coming uh, couple of months. Okay, so, um, you know, obviously we, um, we wanted to investigate whether micro reviews could behave um, as interesting elements uh, that may possess some, um, in addition to their um, biological properties, possess some interesting photochemical properties. Okay, and so before we talk about, uh, you know, what exactly I did, I thought it'd be a good idea to just introduce my reviews a little bit. Okay, so microtubules are these um, long slender polymers. Okay, they're made up of 13 columns of, of, of this protein called tubulin. Okay, uh, each column is officially called a protofilament. Okay, and 13 of these um, wrap around to form a single cylinder, which is the microtubule. Okay, so that's tubulin. Okay, so tubulin um, forms microtubules in these linear columns, which are then present all over the cell. Okay, each tubulin is about eight nanometers long and four and a half nanometers wide. Okay, um, they're about six nanometers deep. Now, microtubules are important for cellular function. Okay, so they're typically studied to because they maintain cell shape and rigidity. Um, they're important for cell division and um, they act uh, as scaffolds uh, for macromolecular transport. So the example I typically give is if you want to you know, move a mitochondria from point A in the cell to point B, you do it along a microtubule. Okay, so you have these, what are called motor proteins that literally walk on top of microtubules. Um, and so microtubules typically play a variety of structural roles in the cell. And this is why biologists study microtubules. It's, um, it's, it's unclear, however, whether they could play some photophysical roles in the cell. And that's why we study them. So it's, it, we don't study the canonical biological properties as much as we study them as, as photophysical structures. Okay. So typically a biologist would, um, would use the fact that, my, my, that microtubules interact with these proteins called MAPs, okay, microtubule associated proteins. Um, so, you know, so they walk on, on a microtubule, like I said, um, the um, you know, different shapes in the shapes of the cell are regulated by a microtubule. And precisely speaking, they're regulated by a microtubule map interactions. Okay, there's several drugs such as Taxol um, that interact with microtubules to achieve their biochemical goals. Okay, this is not why we're studying microtubules. We are interested in microtubules um, because of four reasons. Okay, the first one is as Travis mentioned, there's, a, there's an abundance of aromatic amino acids, okay, that interact with UV light. Okay, so tryptophan, tyrosine, and thyroxine absorb light in the UV regime and emit it also in the UV regime. Okay, so if you, if you take, for example, tryptophan, um, it absorbs light at about 280 nanometers, so you can see this peak here, and it emits light um, in the 320 to 350 nanometer regime. Okay, and tyrosine and phenylalanine are similar. Okay. Um, the second reason is that the distances between aromatic amino acids between neighboring tubulin dimers are very short, enabling energy transfer that can actually take place. So if one aromatic amino acid on one end of the microtubule absorbs light, it can potentially transfer energy to the next tubulin dimer, okay? This is where short distances become very important because coupling strengths, transfer probabilities are regulated by distances. The microtubule itself has a long range order that's often been likened to a lattice. Okay, a lattice is something solid state physicists study. It's something that, um, uh, that has a periodic structure. 
and hence enables uh, a long range interaction to emerge. So the thought is that um, that light absorbed at one end of a microtubule, the lattice structure could, could be harnessed to transfer this light energy to the other end of a microtubule, okay. And of course, as Travis mentioned, a microtubule is directionally polarized, meaning one end is not equal to the other end. Okay, so it's chiral, all right. Um, so this is really why, um, why one would be interested in a microtubule from a, from a physics standpoint and not from a, uh, from a biological standpoint, okay. Um, of course, interestingly enough, tubulin has a highly conserved amino acid sequence. So the tubulin in our body is, is not too different from the tubulin in a plant, is not too different from the tubulin in a dog, is not too different from the tubulin in a bacteria. Well, bacteria is actually FTA, bacteria is different, uh, okay? But any, any eukaryotic uh, tubulin is, is, is similar. All right. Um, so the thought is um, that, that microtubules could be used for light harvesting. So there are several uh, photobiomodulation therapies that expose the cell to light, right? So you have UV light entering the cell, for example. I'm just, I'm just this is just a crazy idea, okay? Um, you have UV light entering the cell. And this is, of course, photobiomodulation, of course, is not the only way um, light, the cell is exposed to light. Um, mitochondria, um, there are these reactive oxygen species that the mitochondria produces that relax back into their ground state. As they do so, they emit UV light, okay? This UV light could be harnessed by a tubulin dimer, like I was mentioning, and transferred among tubulin dimers along a microtubule, potentially to perform some useful biological work, or maybe emit light at the end of a microtubule. Okay, so you could either use UV light through photobiomodulation, which is to say you directly expose a cell to UV light, or you don't expose a cell to UV light, but you use the, the UV light that the mitochondria anyway produces um, to generate some kind of biological effect out of a microtubule. What could this biological effect be? Could such energy transfer even take place? Is this even viable? These are the questions we started out trying to answer, okay? Um, and of course, um, you know, my previous, um, this is a linear pattern, but, but there are more exotic uh, patterns that could emerge. There are thoughts that uh, when a microtubule associated protein binds to a microtubule, it could kick off a pattern of what are called excitons that, em that emerge in a microtubule, okay? Um, different microtubule associated proteins and different drugs could bind different places on the microtubule lattice potentially kicking off different patterns of excitons in a microtubule, right? Now, von Neumann showed the different patterns in a lattice emerged in this, emerging in this manner could allow for computation. Okay, this is called cellular automata. Could computation in this manner be achieved in a microtubule through exciton patterns? That's another larger question, right? So can microtubules act as channels that act as channels that process photonic information, right? Either linearly um, through the mitochondria uh, schematic that I showed, or through more uh, you know, more complicated methods um, that von Neumann and 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 Dr. Hammeroff have, have thought of. So we decided to answer these. Um, start addressing some of these larger questions through some smaller experiments. And we, we singled out tryptophan as the amino acid we wanted to study because tryptophan has the highest quantum yield among the three aromatic amino acids. Okay, so tryptophan has a marginally higher quantum yield than tyrosine, a significantly higher quantum yield than tryptophanine. Uh, the quantum yield, remember, remember is uh, photons emitted per photon absorbed, okay? Uh, so it's sort of, you can think of it as the efficiency of emission, okay? So, so for, the, for the number of photons you absorb, how many do you emit? Um, that's the question that the quantum yield uh, value answers. Okay, so like I said, tryptophan absorbs at 280 nanometers. 
Uh, and what we did was um, we found a commercially available tubulin that was conjugated to AMCA, okay, a fluorophore that absorbs light not at 280, but at 350 nanometers, okay, 345 nanometers, okay. Now, AMCA, like I said, absorbs at, 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 at 350 nanometers. After absorbing at 350 nanometers, it emits at 450 nanometers. Okay, so if you if you plot in a 2D emission absorption spectrum, you would get this curve with a peak um, at the 350 to 450 point. Okay. However, AMCA conjugated to microtubules, of course, has this this 350 450 peak, but it also has an additional peak here. Okay, and here. This peak, these two peaks tell us that you can excite at 280 nanometers at basically exciting tryptophan. And at this, by exciting tryptophan allows you to get an emission out of AMCA, okay? So to, to get an AMCA emission, you don't actually have to excite AMCA. You can just excite a tryptophan to get an AMCA emission, okay? And so this tells us that AMCA is a fluorophore that accepts energy from tryptophan in a microtubule, okay? So of course, conventionally, if you just to take a step back, you'd excite AMCA to get an emission out of it, right? But here, you're exciting tryptophan to get an emission out of AMCA. And this indicates that, that there is energy transfer between tryptophan and AMCA, okay? So we used um, this energy transfer between tryptophan and AMCA as a proxy, really, to study energy transfer to study excitons within a microtubule. Okay. Um, and the technique we used is something called a time correlated single photon count. It's a TCSPC, okay? We had a diode exciting at 305 nanometers, um, essentially exciting tryptophans, okay? Um, we detected tryptophan emission at 335 nanometers, and we measured the delay between excitation and emission plotted it on a histogram. One can then fit this histogram to three lifetimes, to, to, three, to three exponentials, okay? Extracting three lifetimes out of, um, out of this graph. Okay, so you, so you can get three fluorescence lifetimes of tryptophan out of this graph. Okay, and we know the tryptophan has three fluorescence lifetimes because it's it's already well known um, that this is how tryptophan behaves. So we knew to fit it to three uh, to three exponentials. Okay, it has it has two it has three conformers that give you uh, uh, the two exponentials, and the third uh, fit was was because of scatter. Okay, what we did then once we knew that we had um, three exponentials for tryptophan was of course, the AMCA experiment, okay? So we mixed some fully labeled AMCA tubulin where every single tubulin was labeled with AMCA and mixed it with some unlabeled tubulin where tubulin was not labeled with AMCA, okay? So we had a mixture where some tubulins were labeled with AMCA and others were not. Okay, we then polymerized microtubules out of these, um, out of these, uh, AMCA labeled tubulin dimers. And depending on the amount of fully labeled and the amount of unlabeled tubulin we had, we could, we could essentially create a variety of labeling, right? So we could have completely unlabeled microtubules that had no AMCA on it. You know, one third where every third tubulin was labeled with AMCA. Um, and fully labeled AMCA tubulin where every single tubulin was labeled with AMCA. Okay, um, if you do have AMCA labeled tubulin, you reduce the lifetime. Okay, so remember the three fits of lifetime we had? The fit values you get would be lower with AMCA, right? So, so, so you'd get a steeper curve, qualitatively speaking, if you did have AMCA labeled tubulin, okay? And depending on the amount of AMCA labeled tubulin you had, you could actually get a different set of lifetimes that depended on the, on the precise concentration of AMCA. Right. 
So different AMCA labeling fractions report different tryptophan lifetimes. And, and, and of course, you can then change microtubule biochemistry and read out how tryptophan lifetimes change. And that would tell you how the energy transfer between AMCA and tryptophan was changing as a function of biochemistry, right? Okay. Um, so we did that. We we got uh, we we labeled we titrated the uh, the concentration of AMCA on uh, on a microtubule. Okay, so you have one in seven labeled, um, every one labeled, um, one in six labeled, so on and so forth. Uh, we imaged our microtubules under a microscope, verifying that we actually had microtubules. You know, you need to be very careful in these experiments. Um, just making sure you have. Uh, everything you think you have. So, and once we verified that the presence of microtubules was actually there, we then um, used the lifetimes. So we, we fit, like I mentioned, we, we fit the, the, these plots to three lifetimes. I'll show you only two because the third lifetime was scattering, okay? And you can see in these two lifetimes that the lifetime, that both these lifetimes drop as a function of increasing AMCA concentration. Okay, so as you increase the AMCA concentration, the lifetime drops and the dotted lines, um, the dashed lines show you the, the lifetimes of, of unlabeled microtubules where there was no AMCA present um, on, the, on, the, on the microtubule, okay. Okay, so this is, so this is actually just GTP tubulin, okay. It turned out we got, um, we got a different set of curves for microtubules. Okay, so that's the red line here. And you can see that the, so the, you can see, you can see two things here. One is that the, that the AMCA labeling trends here are entirely different. Okay, so the blue line is significantly different from the red line. That's the first result. The second result is that the dotted lines are also different. Okay, indicating that there is actually some energy transfer between tryptophans that may take place in a microtubule. Okay, so not only is tryptophan transferring energy to AMCA in a different manner, but tryptophan is transferring energy to, to neighboring tryptophans in a microtubule, is what this graph might show. Okay, um, notice that um, the, the, the blue line ends up saturating with the dotted blue line fairly rapidly, right? You can see that in both these graphs. But the red line, which is the microtubule line, there's actually a gap between the dotted line and the continuous line. Okay? And that indicates that, that there is no saturation. And that may indicate that the energy transfer is taking place to at least seven dimers away. Okay, because because uh, because this is the one in seven labeling ratio. Okay, so this is this uh, this, is, this is the green line over here. Okay. All right. So so could this uh, could this just be some kind of epiphenomenon that I'm seeing um, that that I'm getting energy transfer at least seven dimers away? Could this just be some kind of averaging effect, for example? Um, well, no because my, my tubulin dimers, my blue line is actually saturating. Okay, so if you look at, if I just erase the, my graph here, you can see that the blue line is actually saturating and it's just the red line that's not saturating. So clearly this is not an epiphenomenon. Clearly there is some, some interesting long range energy transfer that is taking place within a microtubule. So remember the, 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 the schematic that I showed you Previously, uh, you know, microtubules inside a cell, you have light falling at one end of a microtubule and tryptophans transferring energy to neighboring tubulin dimers and so on and so forth. My data seems to show that energy transfer like that may actually take place potentially up to seven dimers away. Okay. You can fit this data um, to what's called a stern Volmer plot and extract quenching constants. Okay, I mean, you can see that tubulin is significantly different from a microtubule in terms of quenching constants, okay? So um, a microtubule has a quenching constant that's about four 
uh, four per picosecond. So that shows you an energy transfer event between AMCA and tryptophan takes place four times uh, a picosecond in a, mic in a microtubule, but only one time a picosecond in a tubulin dimer. Okay, you can just tell, uh, visually speaking, from the stern polymer graph. Now, um, if long range energy transfer, as I claim, is actually taking place in a microtubule, um, well then the microtubule, changing the microtubule morphology would actually influence the energy transfer, right? So if I have um, a 13 protofilament microtubule, uh, energy transfer would be different from a 14 protofilament microtubule, okay? A 14 protofilament microtubule has a kink in the lattice, okay? So, so the microtubule lattice is straight here. So if you, I just drew the dotted line to show you that. So protofilament here is straight, right? But in a 14 protofilament microtubule, there's an angle of the protofilament. You see, it's not actually straight. There's actually, there's a kink to the lattice. Okay, if long range energy transfer was actually taking place, then I should get a different value for a 14 protofilament microtubule because of this kink, right? Um, so changing the biochemistry here may actually alter um, my lifetimes if long range transfer was actually taking place, right? But, but of course, if only short range transfer was taking place, then changing the large scale geometry would not influence uh, lifetimes. Okay, so, you, so once again, you make sure you have 14 protofilament microtubules. Um, you do that using EM, electron microscopy, and you perform the exact same experiment or you measure tryptophan lifetimes, uh, 14 protofilament microtubules, and you fit them to three exponentials, one of which um, we don't consider because it's just scattering. And straight away, we saw, we saw two, two different, um, so you see the purple line uh, in lifetime one is actually overlapping with the pink line, but in lifetime two, you can see that they're not actually overlapping, okay? Might that indicate there is different energy transfer that takes place in a 14 protofilament microtubule compared to that of a 13 protofilament microtubule? That's the question we're trying to answer. But at any rate, when we changed the AMCA concentration, we found that the that the that the the, trip, the energy transfer of tryptophan was actually similar. Okay, indicating that saturation was actually taking place in a fourteen protofilament microtubule that was not taking place in a thirteen protofilament microtubule. You see, in a 13 protofilament microtubule, you get saturation. So, so what happens is the, the dotted line, so it's sorry, in a, in a 14 protofilament microtubule, the dotted line meets the continuous line somewhere over here, right? But in the 13 protofilament microtubule, as I showed you previously, let me just go back. They don't actually meet, okay? The fact that the 14 protofilament microtubule saturates indicates that there is actually a smaller amount of long range energy transfer, a shorter range energy transfer that takes place in a 14 PF microtubule. Okay, sure enough, when we fit it to a stern volcanic graph, we find that um, the rate constant is actually lower. So it's about three and a half times a picosecond, um, whereas the microtubule was 4.22 times a, a picosecond. Okay, are these differences significant? That's the question we're trying to answer right now. Okay, and really remember the differences um, stem from the unlabeled uh, graphs, right? So the difference between the purple line and the, and the red line uh, in the dotted forms, okay? Because the, the, AMCA the AMCA lifetimes are similar in both cases, okay? Now, of course, the big question, we know, so we found some interesting effects of biochemistry, changing the morphology, influenced energy transfer. But could anesthetics influence energy transfer? Um, right, that's the big question. So anesthetics block consciousness and, and this may allow insight into its mechanisms. 
Um, okay, so so um, our collaborator Eric Zizi actually showed that um, that you have a variety of of anesthetics that bind to microtubules to tubulins, um, indicating that they may actually act as potential candidates. What we did was we decided to repeat the exact same experiment, but with AMCA, so, so with anesthetics bound. Okay, you now look at tryptophan lifetimes, how AMCA changes tryptophan lifetimes, but in the presence of anesthetics. Does the presence of anesthetics change tryptophan lifetimes? Okay, so could it, so if you normally have exiton, you know, migration taking place at a certain rate in a microtubule, could the presence of anesthetics, which I've shown in blue here, could they actually um, reduce the rate of energy transfer? Could, so we found um, that could, could the anesthetics actually dampened the rate of AMCA tryptophan interaction. And let me let me let me show you that. So once again, we you know repeat the same experiment. You find tryptophan lifetimes. You but of course this is in the presence of the 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 anesthetic etomidate. Um, you have labeled microtubules, AMCA labeled microtubules. Um, you remember the graph looks like this. The microtubules don't actually saturate. There's a gap between the dotted line and the continuous line. When we have just atomidate present, um, the green line is similar to the red line, indicating that the presence of atomidate didn't actually change lifetimes. However, you begin to see a difference when you have AMCA present. So this is in many ways the opposite of the 14 protofilament case. Remember how the, the red line and the purple line was similar? In this case, we actually found differences between the green line and the red line, indicating that the presence of atomidate actually changed the tryptophan lifetime in a concentration dependent manner. Okay. Was this a one-off? Well, when we added isoflurane, we found it had an even stronger um, interaction with, uh, with, uh, with, with AMCA tryptophan interactions. Okay. Meaning that the presence of anesthetics did actually, well, at least the ones we tried out, did actually interfere with, uh, with the AMCA tryptophan interaction, right? You can see very clearly that they, they increase the lifetimes of, uh, of tryptophan in the presence of AMP. Okay, and so anesthetics decrease the rate of tryptophan quenching by AMCA. Remember how I showed um, previously that um, there is uh, energy transfer up to seven dimers away? This result appears to indicate that energy transfer takes place to a shorter distance when. Um, when anesthetics are present. So say five dimers away or six dimers away, okay? Um, and sure enough, the KQ, the, the quenching rate constants are lower with, with, with atomidate and with, with isoflurane, okay? Um, so, you know, microtubule is 4.22, these are 3.10 and 3.45. Um, and so really, th these are the takeaways um, from my talk. So the first one is that 13 and 14 protofilament microtubules are different. They have significantly different fluorescence lifetimes, suggesting the presence of long range energy transfer in microtubules. The second big result is that the anesthetics we tried out at least appear to dampen interactions between AMCA and tryptophan, suggesting that they can actually mediate electron exciton transfer um, in microtubules. Um, so that's, uh, that's really the, the update on the experimental end. Uh, I think Professor Dugariu has some more interesting results from his lab, uh, but I'd really like to thank um, the Templeton team, Professor Scholes in particular, um, I, I'm, I'm postdoc in his lab, uh, Professor Tijinsky, Professor McIver, Professor Penrose, um, Professor Craddock, who we just heard, Professor Hammeroff, Professor Dugariu, for their useful insights. Uh, we used to meet once every two weeks when these results were being uh, performed. When these experiments were being performed uh, and really brainstorm. So thank you for that. I'd like to thank the schools group um, for their useful um, 
insight into into some of my experiment results for constructive criticism um, and Sophie Travis for performing experiments. Uh, the Temperature team uh, was funded by the Temperature World Charity Forum. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm a postdoc at Princeton and I'm very lucky to have such a collaborative atmosphere here. So with this, I thank you for your attention. Uh, uh, time for a few short questions for Arat. Arat, are you okay to answer a few questions? Of course, go for it. Arat, can you hear me? Oh yeah, you should. Um, yeah, go for it. Uh, I can answer questions. Does anyone have any questions for Arat and his work? Yeah, we have one at the back. You, uh, you seem to be describing microtubules as uh, something of, uh, let's just say, antenna um, the, uh, that can transmit or receive at uh, either greater or lesser extent. And the, the anesthetics affect that, uh, that transmission rate. Um, it, uh, the uh, analogy that jumps to mind is uh, microtubules moving in phase array and to what extent they might move in the phase array and how you might describe that. Could you address that? Yeah, so that's a very good, that's a very good um, question. From what I understand, uh, you're asking about, about coherences, right? Is, is that, is that what, you, what you're alluding to? Yes. Right, yeah, so this is a very good question. Uh, and this is something Professor Craddock has actually worked on. Experimentally, our work has not actually um, explored coherence. We're moving very slowly. You know, in these experiments, you have to be very careful, right? So right now, um, my data just shows that there's interesting effects that cannot be explained by um, just simple Foster resonance energy transfer, for example. Are there coherent effects taking place with the phase relationship uh, between the excitons? Um, that it is the million dollar question. And the answer is, I don't know, not as yet. Uh, we, 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 you know, but, but it's a very good question. We want to get there. Anyone else? Yeah. Could someone bring the microphone up to the front here? Oh, he's almost here. He's fast. Uh, Arat, um, you showed a very strong effect with isofluorine. Have you tested that uh, for significance, uh, statistical significance? That's another outstanding question. So it turns out um, the, the specific test one uses is really important. Um, because remember, these are exponentials we're fitting. So these are fits extracted from exponentials. So even though you may get a significant answer in the fit parameter, it may not necessarily be significant in the, in the grand scheme of things, which is to say in the actual exponential. So I'm exploring ways to, to, to essentially elucidate which, which is the statistic, statistical test that would be most appropriate. Because it seems, it seems a simple two-tailed um, p-test or you know, a p-value analysis may, uh, may or may not be enough. You know, one has to be very careful. Well, thank you. Okay, did anyone else have a question? All right, let's thank uh, the speaker. Thank you for having me. Okay, up next, we're going to have uh, Dr. Bruce McIver uh, come and speak about anesthesia. Uh, Professor McIver explores the molecular and cellular mechanisms of sedatives and anesthetics and how these drugs alter higher nervous system functions to produce loss of consciousness. He was trained in neuroscience and pharmacology at the University of Calgary and began his career at Stanford over 30 years ago and has directed the Stanford Neuropharmacology Laboratory since then. Current research is directed at the development of safer and more effective anesthetics using state-of-the-art electrophysio electrophysiological approaches, using in vitro brain slice preparations and freely moving animal models. He is also using newly developed EEG analysis techniques in animals and human subjects 
to quantify brain states associated with the loss and recovery of consciousness. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, you all. Thank you, Travis. Uh, I am particularly impressed with uh, Travis's uh, presentation. Uh, that's the best uh, review of microtubules I've ever seen from both a biological and chemical uh, perspective. Um, I'm only going to briefly comment on the anesthetic uh, side of the story. My expertise is what are the effective concentrations of anesthetics in you and I when we lose consciousness. And uh, we specifically targeted those concentrations for isoflurane and atomidate. So these are the same concentrations that would be achieved in our brain at loss of consciousness. Now, beyond that, one thing that, that was missed was that in addition to having multiple tryptophans on each uh, tubulin dimer or microtubule, there are multiple anesthetic binding sites, um, anywhere from five to 15 places where anesthetics can bind on microtubules and have been shown uh, to bind. So uh, it's a relevant protein in terms of having the ability to interact with anesthetics. Um, beyond that, I think uh, the experimental data we just saw is very encouraging. We still need to polish it up and, and replicate, um, but as a first step, um, it's all we could have hoped for really. Uh, what's the relevance? Well, we all know that consciousness can be abolished by anesthetics. Uh, and that occurs uh, across uh, species, um, all the way down to single cell organisms with flagella, they, you, you can reversibly block their movement. Uh, and on up into uh, plants, we'll hear about this afternoon from Rajneesh uh, Khanna in, in a workshop on uh, altering how plants can be altered by anesthetics, but also how plants can produce uh, medicinals that alter our consciousness. So we've got uh, Deepak Chopra uh, and Dennis McKenna will be talking about that. And our, a local hero, uh, Patrice uh, Gonzalez, who's a uh, specializes in Native American um, culture, traditions, and ceremonies that all interact with um, the idea of consciousness. And so she'll be talking about interesting uh, things that our native ancestors can teach us about, uh, particularly medicinals like peyote, et cetera. So anyhow, um, I'll just um, leave it at that, that uh, we're uh, pursuing uh, anesthetic effects on different levels of life forms and at concentrations that are relevant to loss of consciousness in humans, which I think is important. Early work um, on, on these topics have generally used way higher concentrations of anesthetics that are clearly not relevant to consciousness. Uh, so we've been trying to target that specifically. And Rajneesh is going to show you some really interesting um, data on the involvement of microtubules in phototropism uh, in plants. And we know that the phototropism uh, clearly involves microtubule rearrangements, and the anesthetics are blocking that at concentrations that are uh, relevant to human consciousness. So uh, anyhow, thanks for joining us today. We'll hear some more experimental results here uh, in the next talk.
Thank you, Dr. McIver. Uh, for the next uh, little bit, we're going to take a coffee break. Um, if we come back at 1035 for the next presentation, we'll hear from uh, work on delayed luminescence from Aristide Degario's group at the University of Central Florida. Thank you. Um, our next group of speakers is uh, coming to us from closer to my, my home place of uh, Florida, speaking out of Orlando. Um, we have uh, uh, contributions from the group of Dr. Aristide Degario of University of Central Florida. Uh, Dr. Degario received his PhD from Hokkaido University and is currently University Trustee Chair and Pegasus Professor at Creole, the College of Optics and Photonics, University of Central Florida. His research interests include optical physics, electrodynamics, wave propagation, and complex media. And we are going to be hearing from uh, two of his postdocs, uh, Jian Shen and uh, Mahed Batarse. Uh, Mahed, who is recently uh, graduated with her PhD or received her PhD, uh, I think about a week ago. So, congratulations. Uh, she's going to be talking about her work, which includes studying the light matter interaction and information contents in such interactions. So, please welcome Dr. Batarse. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Travis, for the introduction and uh, for the interesting talks. Uh, every one of them was uh, educational. Uh, um, today, I'm going to talk about delayed luminescence in tubulin constructs. Um, basically, uh, the experimental results that we have um, uh, di uh, we did during uh, our uh, investigation from tubulin and the effect structures. Um, we will uh, talk about ultrophoton emission from biological samples. Basically, um, generally everyone knows that um, all of us emit light and this light um, can be excited and um, for biological samples, a lot of people uh, associated to oxidation and metabolic processes. Um, and different uh, literature um, use different terminologies uh, to explain this emission from biological samples. It was uh, demonstrated that actually this UPE or ultra low photon emission actually uh, can be induced um, externally by either changing temperature of the biological sample or adding stress or some uh, affecting the chemical concentration um, of the environment around it as well as what we are gonna actually be interested in is the optical excitation why uh, ultra low photon emission aside from um, understanding the fundamental effects uh, the fundamental um, causes for such emission, it actually can be uh, used uh, as a good uh, application for diagnostic uh, technique. It was uh, demonstrated that uh, in plants, uh, sick plants actually emit, em uh, it has higher emission than normal, uh, than not sick plants, as well as the stress level from salt uh, in, uh, is reflected in the level of intensity and um, it can be used uh, to detect pollution in water level even. Uh, in bio uh, applications, uh, it was demonstrated as well that the emission from um, the skin, um, especially when you uh, excite it with UV, it will have higher intensity than um, when you just leave it uh, in a dark adaptation. Also, it was demonstrated that cancerous cells uh, can show higher intensity uh, than normal cells. But the, still the question that everyone shares and is open is actually what is the nature of this emission and what is the properties and what can affect this emission? To understand this uh, more, because due to the fact that biological sample is more complex, we needed to go to the sub, uh, subcellular uh, level and look into elements in cells that can be responsible for this emission. Uh, as we are uh, seeing from the talk uh, about microtubules, 
um, microtube is why this is important uh, because it is an element that is uh, vital for different functions in the cells and it's actually uh, available everywhere in different types of cells uh, and is responsible. Um, why we are interested of uh, microtubules? In short uh, description, uh, microtubules are a hollow helical structures. Uh, basically, tubulin of alpha and beta dimers uh, are uh, aligned or polymerized uh, when you introduce um, heat to it uh, into this interesting structure. Uh, as actually mentioned from uh, one of the audience before, this, um, this uh, interesting helica hollow structure uh, can be considered as an antenna like for such uh, emission. So the question that comes to place is now, what is the influence of the structure and the length of microtubule on this emission? So uh, what, we, what we're going to talk about in general is the delayed uh, luminescence and um, the mechanism of storing and releasing. What we're going to do is that we're going to excite the sample optically and observe the decay from this from the biological samples. Um, there are different properties uh, that are um, been investigated. Uh, some of them are uh, diff uh, has uh, mixed reports, mixed uh, conclusions. Um, and but what we are going to talk about is that the time scales of the micro uh, the electromagnetic waves or the emission from the biological samples that we're interested in are in the long range. Um, this is not, um, it can be seen actually that these long range of uh, milliseconds or even actually it was observed that it takes minutes uh, of decaying of uh, emission from biological sample, it was actually observed. So our range of observation is not, even though it can be considered long for fluorescent people, but is not unusual in the literature. In our observation, or uh, to do to run our measurements, we um, were showing that experimental setup. Uh, basically, what we're gonna, uh, what we have, is a fiber uh, laser, uh, fiber excitation, and um, a shutter in front of it, and then the sample will be placed inside an incubator. And uh, in, um, in front of it, there's uh, another shutter for the detector and then a PMT, a photomultiplier tube. Uh, basically, uh, the sequence of our measurement is that we place the sample inside the incubator. And then after dark adaptation of 10 minutes, we take uh, a background reference. And then we do an excitation stage where basically the source of emission and the shutter in front of it are open and they are they are exciting the sample. During the time of excitation, both the shutter, the mechanical shutter in front of the PMT is closed to block any, uh, any emission or any effect from during excitation. After we're done with excitation, we open the PMT, but before that, we close the shutter and the source, uh, the shutter in front of the source, as well as the sort, and we open the PMT, and the PMT counts, um, collects the counts, and we uh, ca our count is one millisecond, or uh, one kilohertz. This is our definition of one cycle, and we repeat this ex uh, excitation and detection stage uh, as we as we want, and um, it takes, for example, an hour. Uh, our measurement of multiple uh, excitation and detection and excitation. So our capabilities or the setup that uh, that we have, uh, we off, uh, the setup offers a lot of variables and tuning parameters. One of them is actually the uh, excitation. It can be done. Uh, here we have uh, at the fiber, it is connected to a four wave uh, LED uh, where each one of them we control uh, the emission and the wavelength of each emission. We move, can excite 
at uh, 385 or uh, 455 or even green and red. And the other thing is that in front of the PMT in this uh, uh, in this port, we can add filters, and these filters can help us in uh, the, um, in controlling the, the spectral uh, acceptance at the PMT. Uh, aside from all these, we actually looked, uh, we chose uh, a PMT that has a very dark count um, to, uh, to this, is, I'm going to say why, as well as it is on the visible range. Um, another thing that we have is actually uh, our incubator or the sample is being placed in this incubator. We can control the temperature as well as we have the freedom to inject uh, gases uh, in the sample. These are the different uh, capabilities of our setup and uh, different um, aspect of freedom that we can control. Uh, why we care this much about uh, this? Because um, as we, as I shown before, is that our emission is very low, and we needed to. Uh, look into the levels of a very low count. In fact, if you see, if you see this uh, setup, this setup is inside of a box of a black, completely black box. And on top of everything, we cover it and then we get out of the room, turn off everything and get out. And uh, we, it is complete darkness to avoid any uh, influence from uh, artificial noise that can affect our emission and decay. So what we wanted to ask again is that, as we mentioned before, with the emission from a structure of tubulin and microtubule be different or not. So what we're so, uh, show, exact, uh, this is a demonstration of the decay that we, uh, we measured uh, from two different samples. Here is a tubulin dimers. Basically, the tubulin are locked with colchicin to avoid any poly polymerization. On the, other, uh, on the other sample, we tested a uh, structures microtubule. These two samples have the same amount of matter, but they have different structure. However, in the, when, we put them, when we put the sample inside our uh, setup and we looked into the decay that comes from, uh, the three, uh, from these two samples, we have and fit them to uh, an exponential, a three term of an exponential, we could see that uh, the decay itself for the microtubule compared to the tubulin is first higher of emission as well the decay is faster. Um, so what we want to, what we are seeing from this uh, experiment is that again, that the emission is having a higher level at the microtubule and the lifetime is longer. So this actually gives us um, the conclusion that uh, that structure matters in this emission. One can argue, okay, so these are two, two separate samples. So biological effects or bi biological variants can take place in seeing this artificial signal, let's say. So what we did on another experiment is that we have uh, uh, tubulin, uh, tubulin. We started with tubulin sample, um, and then we, uh, due to the, uh, we have the capability of increasing the temperature from the incubator. So the sample, when you increase the temperature of the sample, uh, you could um, increase the polymerization. Basically, you make the tubulin move towards a structural microtubules. So during the time of our increase of temperature uh, from 20 to 39 uh, Celsius, we actually did this uh, uh, excitation detection stage and we monitored the emission that comes as time passes. So do, this is actually the axis indicates the temperature increase. So we monitored the emission about, about one hour and a half uh, of excitation and detection. And one could see that actually the emission is uh, increases as well as the lifetime. Here is just an exponent, uh, the 
we looked into the longest lifetime uh, of the three exponential. And you could see that as time passes and the increase of temperature in, uh, induces the polymerization, the lifetime increases. So what we're, t we're looking at these lifetime, one can see that these lifetimes are in uh, hundreds of milliseconds. This is not unusual uh, because uh, it has been observed in different uh, structures that they can uh, have a very long lifetime. In fact, uh, as had been uh, discussed before, it can be associated to the tryptophan and the structure of uh, and the reorientation of the tryptophan. Uh, what we wanted to highlight is that our excitation is far from, um, this is our excitation, it's 385 nanometer. It's uh, near, uh, it's in the visible range. Um, so it is not related to the uh, usual fluorescent excitation uh, of tryptophan. Um, so these basically show us that actually the structure of, my, uh, of tubulin, if they are dimers or microtubule, it can affect our uh, emission and it makes it longer. Uh, so what we wanted to show here is actually um, an effect of different um, anesthetic or uh, binders that affect the, um, uh, the microtubule. Basically, one can see that um, by adding eto etomidate or even noscapine, these are, dim uh, these are uh, um, agents that bind with uh, tubulin. Uh, in the structure of my microtubules, we have seen that the lifetime increases a little bit. Uh, below is actually um, just a demonstration of our fitting uh, compared to the actual data that we measure. You could see that we are fitting very well. Uh, the red line, this is basically the red line indicates the fitting for the three exponential. Uh, one thing we need to highlight is that in other literature, they have used a power law fit uh, to show the effect. These, the power law can be considered as uh, a summation of different exponential fits. So these are all of these uh, experimental demonstrations shows um, an interesting um, if, uh, phenomena and uh, that the duration of the emission can be affected uh, by structure and by other agents. So, um, just uh, uh, aside from the life life, uh, lifetime trends that we are targeting, um, what we, we can do is that um, we can test, uh, study the effect uh, from statistical properties. Basically here, it's just um, additional thing that we are actually uh, looking at is that if I put a, a piece of uh, leaf and monitor its decay, you could see that the lifetime actually is very long compared to the microtubule. And this is, can be associated to actually the effect of uh, being a more complex structure. Uh, the below is just the residual of uh, the fitting compared to the uh, experimental data. What I wanted to show here as well is that actually we are trying to understand the statistical properties of the decay of this emission. Here's just a video of the photon count and the probability distribution, how it is uh, more a Poissonian distribution compared to just a thermal Bose-Einstein distribution. All these are actually interesting uh, observations and uh, one could, um, the main goal of uh, the research as well as what we're aiming for and the question that we ask is that if I excite an emitter, uh, either biological emitter or uh, any, um, any non-biological emitter, and excited, and then I, dem I see a decay after uh, the excitation is turned off. What would happen to the decay if I bring a, a close enough the same identical emitters and I excite them, uh, all of them simultaneously, and then I um, remove it, would the emission actually be longer or shorter? Uh, so in our experimental data, we're actually seeing that as you bring the um, 
the particles get uh, closer enough, there is a longer uh, lifetime trend. Uh, in fact, uh, my colleague will uh, discuss shortly uh, in the next uh, talk about the model that he used to observe the effect, and uh, he show he will see uh, he will demonstrate a long lifetime as uh, explaining it in more details uh, using his model. So uh, these are all open questions and uh, interesting observations about the lifetime. And again, it is uh, re referring back to the structure and would structure matter. And uh, we're seeing that actually it does matter to our emission and the lifetime. Um, thank you. Um, I would uh, hope that uh, our results were um, interesting for you and I'm open for questions. Okay, we have time for a few short questions. If anyone has any, you can come up to the microphone here. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, it seems to be very consistent with what we uh, heard earlier from Iraq. Uh, yeah, the etomidate actually makes the lifetime longer and the structure longer, yeah. And the polymerization does the same thing. Mm -hmm. so it's nice to see consistency is the only point I want to <laughs> make here. Hi, uh, question, uh, the, uh, since the atomidate makes the lifetime longer, could that be why we see fasciculations when we give atomidate uh, initially? Um, I apologize, but I am, I, I don't, I am more in the engineering. I don't know the, um, but like uh, terminologies for medical people. Um, I don't know what are you referring to? Okay, thank you. So sorry, could you could you just define that for us? What, what is oh, like uh, when when uh, we give atomidate IV, uh, uh, usually you see some uh, uh, fasciculations where the uh, like muscle twitches um, uh, immediately after giving it, and then the then you get the anesthetic effect. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I think you see it with atomidate too. But th this is okay. I was just wondering if that had anything to do with it. Uh, if I understand, this is more a mechanical thing because the muscle twitching is more a mechanical observation. So you want to associate the optical uh, emission to some sort of a mechanical consequence. because the muscle twitching is more a mechanical thing. It's not an optical emission. So what we're doing is actually excite, like we're observing the changes in the optical. Um, I, I, to be honest, I'm not sure how it will be related to the, uh, to the effect on more complex um, cells like a muscle, but um, this is an open question and everyone, um, I don't know, to be honest, yeah. This is an interesting question. Thanks for a great talk. Can you explain, expound on the noscopene? So we, the interesting thing about noscopene that we saw is that um, we wanted, we added the same amount of etomidate and noscopene. Uh, noscopene is another uh, by, uh, agent that binds with tubulin. Uh, the complete effect of it, we're, we don't know yet. Um, and uh, what we are trying to do now is a uh, possibility of experiments is to try to uh, play with the concentration to see the effect of both the etomidate and the noscopene on this emission. Uh, but uh, it is one of the uh, suggested um, agents that uh, we wanted to work with aside from the etomidate, just to uh, have some sort of other references to these effects. 
And the dose uh, of noscopine, would that uh, cross the blood-brain barrier? And uh, uh... Um, I don't know uh, more uh, details about how uh, we we associate, we use the same amount that we use for etomidate, which was was fifty micromole. Uh, basically, the ratio between tubulin and micro uh, between tubulin dimers and both noscopine and etomidate is about one to one. Just a, a quick aside here. There, there are papers that say that uh, noscopine crosses the blood-brain barrier to inhibit glioblastoma growth. And the, and the con maybe there's a question for Bruce. The concentration of noscopine in the brain compared to an anesthetic, because anesthetic concentrations are high. Would you expect that that concentration of noscopine? In the brain? Yeah, the noscopine is a non-anesthetic version of atomidate, so it's it's like. Uh, F6, for example, in the volatiles. So uh, we wanted to, to look at that to see if there's a difference between an anesthetic molecule that's nearly identical to a non-anesthetic molecule. So in terms of their physical chemical properties, they're very similar, but one puts you to sleep and the other doesn't. In fact, the uh, noscopine has a slight uh, excitatory effect. Okay, thank you. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you very much, Dr. 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 Thank you. Uh, next, we have up um, another postdoc in Dr. Dugariu's lab, uh, Gian, Dr. Jian Shen. Um, his work is related to different aspects of physical optics related to scattering media. Hello? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, thank you. Um, okay. see. Yeah, hi. Um, so followed by um, Ma's talk, I will discuss the theory about um, the delay luminescence, basically the long living emission. So here's the outline of my talk. Uh, it was separated into uh, two parts. The first one is about the model itself, say focusing on the mechanism of radiative damping. And we were introduced one interesting phenomena if those uh, dipoles are put in a random structure. So for the second talk, say I will focus on more order structure like a uh, microtubule and discuss the different phenomena when it's excited coherently versus uh, incoherently. So uh, the first, uh, um, topic is about radiative damping. So if you have, say, a two-level system, and um, when the electron is in excited state, it cannot stay there forever. So it's will decay uh, after a certain lifetime. So the decay rate is called single dipole damping rate, and the energy is released uh, as radiation. So to visualize this phenomena, I use a classical oscillator. So basically, this is a tuning fork. The energy is stored inside uh, by its potential and kinetic energy. So when you put the tuning fork inside water, uh, it will generate uh, ripples on the water surface and its energy inside is consumed. So it's kind of a vision of radiative damping. So now if I have uh, two tuning forks, they are static initially, and you start to click uh, the left one, the right one will also um, start to vibrate because those two uh, tuning forks are coupled through acoustics. So the same philosophy actually um, can be applied in uh, EM wave. So if you have two dipoles, these two can communicate through EM wave. And now is, so if you have two dipoles, um, actually their phase is very critical. So if they are very close to each other and they are in phase, you will find the lifetime of the net system is shorter than the single one, like uh, Travis uh, discussed in his talk. This is called super radiance. So if you have two, uh, it's doubled the decay rate. I mean, half the, the lifetime. If you have more, then the decay rate will even be higher. Now, reversely, so if those two dipoles has anti-phase in oscillation, then the decay rate is actually can be very, very small in ideal situ situations. This is called subradiance. 
basically the origin of long living phenomena. And now normally uh, in practical situations, we'll have many uh, different mechanisms of decoherence, like those oscillators uh, will have Brownian motions to destroy their uh, fixed relative positions. So if you consider the thermal decoherence in your system, you will find the net decay rate is roughly uh, the single dipole damping rate. So in the following, um, my model just consider everything is coherence, very ideal case. The key is uh, uh, different oscillators will have spatial coherence among each other. So here is the details of the model. Uh, I start from a Langevin equation. So this is the acceleration uh, for, uh, you put a particle in a harmonic potential and you will have friction terms, basically is the origin of uh, radiative damping and the particle mass and the shape of potential will determine the resonant frequency of this oscillator. And you will have an external force to drive it. Uh, it has a certain oscillate at a certain frequency. So now in our case, we have a many body problem. So basically for each dipole, it's affected by the radiation from its neighbor. So different from Travis' talk, so in our case, all the dipoles are excited in an unpolarized way. So the interaction between each other is only one over R, which is called so-called the uh, long range interaction. We don't consider the amnesson wave coupling uh, like the one over R cube in our model. No? So um, based on this Langevin equation, if you write uh, the displacement for each oscillator, separate into two terms, the fast oscillating uh, terms and the complex amplitude. You can simplify the Langevin equation uh, by several approximations, like the slow varying approximation and Markovian, which means there is no memory inside. And you will uh, end up with a linear differential equation. So if you write in a matrix form, uh, it's a um, so the diagonal terms consider the detuning of your excitation, single dipole damping rate, and all, all diagonal terms are about the structure of this um, many body problem. So you can write this equation uh, in an even simpler form. Basically, we focus on this matrix and to solving the eigen solution for it. So the blue one is the eigenvector and the green scalar is the corresponding eigenvalue. So for this matrix, uh, it's non-permission, which means the eigenvalue is complex. It contains, say, both decay and oscillation. And the solution is basically the superpose of many uh, quasi-modes, basically the spatial distribution of energy, how it oscillates and decay in time, and what's their weight. So for example, you have, say, roughly 10 dipoles within a fixed volume, and we try to compress the whole system to make the mean distance between dipole uh, shorter and shorter and to see how it's, uh, um, we observe. And we also observe the system in far field, the intensity. So we'll find uh, the, the black dash line is a single dipole damping rate. Once you uh, compress the system, say mean distance is seven wavelengths, it's roughly the single dipole damping rate. But if you compress more and more, like when the mean distances reach below 0.3 wavelengths, you'll find the intensity decay is actually very flat. So it's dominated by strong subradiance mode. And actually the interesting part is if you check the spatial distribution of different quasi modes, they are dependent. So basically for super radiance, if you want the whole system to react very fast, you need to um, require all dipoles to participate into uh, this work. So basically, it's a it has very high participation ratio. You can say it's a quite global mode. And for subradiance modes, majorly they are uh, quite local, consider localization. So here is an animation for the evolution of this phenomena. So each dot, the position is about the position of dipole. And the color coding is about the relative energy uh, among neighbors. So it's always normalized to one for each time frame. And initially, it's evenly distributed energy within a random spherical structure. 
And now if you let it evolve, they start to uh, tend to be more localized. And if we wait, yeah. So finally, all the energy will migrate uh, to, to the only two lonely uh, dots inside the system. And they will stay there for a very, very long time. Yeah. Until the whole system, say, break its coherence. So basically, this model can provide you both uh, what can be observed in far field and what's going on, like the energy storage within the system. Yeah. So now we make one step further is about, so you, you now excite the system with a certain directional illumination, like a plane wave. So basically you add uh, inhomogeneous terms in the differential equation. So to visualize this is you have a certain structure and it's illuminated by CW wave at a, for a certain direction. And the whole system reached the steady state. And now, Afterwards, you suddenly shut off the incident field, like here. And when the incident field just clears out from the media, there's still energy stored inside, like, like here. It's still oscillate. Yeah. And we define this moment, and say, when the incident field is all cleared out from the system called the initial condition. And the following is all about the radiative coupling uh, between dipoles. Yeah. So for example, for this problem, we fixed the volume to be a spherical shape and the radius of media is roughly four wavelengths. And we try different random configuration of dipoles within the volume. And we observe in far field their intensity and average them to see what's going on. So to excite the, the illumination is from bottom to top reach steady states and release. Then you're, then we try uh, actually three parameters. So from 125 dipoles, basically mean distance above one wavelength to a more, uh, to a denser case, uh, reach 0.3 wavelengths. So initially you will find uh, the, emission, the secondary emission is mainly forward and their angular width is almost the same. And they decay very fast. This is the common super radiance about the whole volume. But the late emission is quite different in its mean distance dependent. The first two cases very similar to coherent backscattering, while the late one is a unidir unidirectional uh, emission. And it can last very long. So it's a kind of directional memory yeah, for the whole uh, system. Yeah. So now we try another case. You have a cylindrical slab and it's a, a yeah and you illuminate it uh, in a tilted version reach steady state and release yeah. so you will find um, the initial emission is mainly uh, transmission and specular reflection but when you wait long enough the emission go back to yourself so in this frame uh, time fix the time frame you can find the evolution for this process so basically, the first picture here is described the steady state situation. The output of emission mainly are three, uh, transmission, um, specular reflection, and backscattering. But when you cut the supply and the, the emission is dominated in the backward direction, and you are, if you check the energy uh, distributed inside, it's the surface uh, has the major contribution. So this is in our latest paper. Yeah. And now the second part is uh, we try to apply the model to a more ordered structure like uh, the microtubule. So actually the microtubule can be uh, checked in different scale. Uh, you can from 100 nanometer scale basically with like a tube to a more detailed structure like what Travis has discussed in his uh, talk. So in our model, we treat each monomer as one uh, scalar dipole and we can uh, generate the structure we are interested. And so we apply the same excitation here, steady state and off to, to see what's the temporal response for the whole system. So the first uh, numerical experiment is you put the microtubule just aligned with your uh, incident field direction and 
this is the initial condition. So when the microtubule becomes longer from 50 cycles to 200, the volume is increased. So the, the uh, super radiance is more narrowed in angular. But when you wait long enough, say 100 times of the single dipole uh, lifetime, they, they will be very different uh, in the structure based on the, the, the mean distance between uh, the particles. Now, and if you observe in one fixed directions to see the intensity, you will find, okay, that for this coherent excitation, the intensity is periodically modulated. So um, it can be kind of a physical mechanism for uh, the communication between microtubules. And now another ex example is a uh, rotate microtubule to be perpendicular to the incident uh, direction. And there will be um, different super radiance behavior and also sub radiance uh, pattern in space. But still, you can see the intensity modulation. So another interesting uh, phenomena about the coherent excitation is so-called N defect. The defect is not, um, so microtubule, uh, is basically a 1D crystal, but the symmetry is just stopped uh, when at the end of the microtubule. So we call it a defect. And it can be related to a uh, disease. Uh, yes. Okay, so now we say we try a microtubule at fixed uh, lens and we try to change the, the pattern at the end of microtubule. So we start from a perfect cycle at the end, 13 uh, filaments, and try different cycles to, to see the, their uh, emissions in space. The time is fixed at a 100 single dipole damping rate. And now you remove five dimers at the end in a cascaded way. Now, so you will find the late emissions will be very different in space. And if you remove the five dimers in a more uh, diluted way, uh, so you will find uh, it's even changed. So basically, you can say um, the end defects can be can have an influence on the late emission. Uh, so uh, still, this is when a microtubule is rotated perpendicular to the incident directions, and we can also see this. But the the pattern of emission is rotated ninety degrees. Uh, so more practically speaking, um, like, like what Mars has done in the experiments, we are um, using an incoherent excitation. So basically for each monomer, uh, it is a multi-level uh, system. And we are interested in a specific transition between two levels, the triplet transition. And we assume, so for this transition, the initial phase is random. So we, we call it incoherence. But for different monomers, they, they still can communicate through each other in a coherent way. Yeah. And we are checking uh, the quenching effect, like uh, what uh, our artist uh, has talked in, in his presentations. So when you add some chemistries, you can uh, shut off some emitters. Yeah. So we start from a ratio zero. Basically, it's a perfect microtubule. And randomly uh, remove some of them. To, to make it a more random structure. And if you are check, say, the decay rate, uh, the, the decay dynamics within 50 dipole uh, lifetimes, single dipole uh, lifetimes, you will find the intensity dynamics is quite similar among this case. This is, say, reasonable because the, the specs uh, we use is we using the wavelengths of 532 and the microtubule the lens is controlled within uh, 400 nanometers. So for these detailed structures, the mean distance is already very dense for these three situations. So the decay dynamics is quite similar. So you can say it's a, um, it's a symbol of robustness of sub radiance. Yeah, that's all my uh, talk, thank you. Yeah. Uh, any questions? Thanks, Dr. Shen. Any questions from the audience? Uh, thank you for that <clears throat> really interesting talk. Uh, what dictates uh, the foci in that 
transition from a super radiant to a sub radiant um, emission pattern to it. So going back to your slide four there. Slide four, you mean? Yep. Yeah. When you showed that uh, mm -hmm. information, what, what's dictating where that, what the foci are that that collapses to? Like what, what is, why does one, one node uh, absorb versus another? Uh, so you mean, what's the, the criteria to distinguish these two types of emission, right? No? Or? Yes. Yeah, so um, basically the reference for this problem is, uh, you, you know what's the decay rate for one single dipole? So basically, if you put this media to be very dilute, the coupling between different dipoles are weak. So the decay rate is um, just a, the black dash line. And when you make it very dense, so it's initially starts from a very fast decay and followed by the slow. So it's always about comparing the decay rate uh, at a certain moment to the, to the single dipole damping rate. So you can know it's faster or slower. Okay, so I, I or we have another question. I have one for you before this guy gets up here. Um, mm -hmm. So in in respect to we were talking about uh, biophotons kind of driving a process like this. We heard uh, Dr. Batarse talk about it. I spoke about it earlier. In that case, you would expect that uh, mitochondria, because of the way that they co-localize with microtubules, that you would be mm -hmm. getting these emissions in the perpendicular uh, frame point. So they would be coming down on the length of the microtubule, not, not parallel to the, to the protofilament, but perpendicular to it. C can you comment on how much of that signal is being backscattered or, or you would expect to be backscattered to potentially go between the mitochondria to the microtubule and then back to the mitochondria? Uh, you mean roughly slide 10, right? So, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so I guess it would be the on the two hundred cycles we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Two mm -hmm. cycles. You're you're talking about spirals of the uh, the microtubule. Yeah, the the, the cycles. Uh, yes, one one cycle, one spiral of microtubule called one cycle. No. Yes. So so how much how much of the incoming uh, um, photon signal or how much of the incoming radiation would be backscattered directly back to the source in the perpendicular case? Um, uh, sorry, this one I haven't checked. No. Okay, so I'm just wondering, so, so, so those two bottom graphs in the 200 cycles, one is the initial initial like at a time point zero and the other is at a later time point yeah and so th those those uh, um little blue lines are they they're indicating the direction of emission yeah yeah so you can say for these two they are comparable yeah? okay mm -hmm. okay thank you mm -hmm. Um, on one of your previous slides, you did the uh, eigenvalue decomposition, um, and right after that, you, I think, did a complex expansion or something along those lines. You added complex components, and I was wondering, did you use those uh, to change the direction of the excitation wave, um, or could you clarify uh, what you did with that? Uh, you mean... From from slide three to to five, right? That's what you want to say. Or oh yeah, that component, the blue component. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. The, the blue yeah. component is about uh, the information of your incident field, which is not related. Uh, oh, you can say it's all about um, where the dipole is in in the phase, in the wave front for for the incident field. Yeah. And here's all about the structure, how dipoles are coupled. 
So yeah. this one where generates the weights of those quasi modes, though each mode, the eigenvalue and eigenvector stays the same because it's all determined by the matrix. So is it like a phase component? Uh, it's, you can say more like you change the CN, which consider it's a complex number, both amplitude and phase. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. There is a one more thank question. Thank you, Dr. Shen. It's, it's a writing one. So, um, Hulley, we seeing it. Okay, that, that uh, uh, brings us to the end of our talks. Uh, we had scheduled um, Dr. Bandiopadier to, um, to speak, but there was confusion with the times and he's on J Japan time, which is about two in the morning right now. So he's, he's unable to speak. Um, however, we do have uh, um, uh, Sir Roger on the line and I would just like to ask if he has any comments that he would like to make about the, uh, the presentation that we've made today. Hello, yes, I am on the line. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. I, I'd have to ask the, the tech guy. There we go, thank you. Okay, we can see you and we can hear you. Do you have any comments you'd like to make? <laughs> well, things have moved enormously since uh, First, well, a long time ago when I wrote first on this topic in a general way, suggesting that the collapse of the wave function had to be an, a, a <clears throat> major component of whatever consciousness is. And wrote the book, The Emperor's New Mind, subsequently Shadows of the Mind after Stuart Hameroff had got hold of my, had read my earlier book and told me the key thing which I'd never heard of before, namely microtubules. Took a long time before people started to do genuine, genuine experiments on these things, which is very exciting for me. It does remind me a little bit of black holes. When I, I uh, first got interested in these things and produced my paper, which seems to have got a Nobel Prize eventually. And that paper was to show that general collapse, gravitational collapse, this is not collapse of the wave function, this is classical collapse of bodies coming together um, and they would produce this singular state. And unless you had some very strange thing going on, you would get these singularities. You couldn't avoid them. And this suggested you had black holes. And then I went to conferences for a long time and people were skeptical for a long time. And you could see the gradually the interests and, and belief in these objects gradually crept up until it got to about 50%, and then it sort of switched right over. So it was quite impressive to see uh, things moving in that direction. So it's uh, interesting here to see how people are take, beginning to take seriously these ideas. Of course, the experiments are to do with whether you see quantum effects and uh, whether you see phenomena which um, seem to require something like that. Uh, it doesn't touch really on the key point which has to do with what's going on in the collapse of the wave function. And the view which I've held for quite a long time is that this is an effect of gravity on systems. And you can come to that conclusion. I'll say something about this in my talk in a few days. But uh, the, um, <clears throat> you come to this view because of a very peculiar um, thing which is happens with gravity and not with any other force, which is well as well known to Galileo, when you imagine he was drop, imagining things dropping from the Leaning Tower and they fall together. And he had a very nice description of fireworks where he showed that the, these fire, as they fall, they beca keep being spherical. They make a spherical pattern and it remains spherical as it falls, which is a feature of this property of gravity which you can get rid of it by accelerating with it. And it's the only force which has that property. And if you, if you um, retain that force, you get a, a contradiction with, with standard quantum mechanics. 
And this contradiction is what I regard as uh, something you follow up and it leads, at least suggests that the uh, formula for when a system which involves the superposition of an object in two separate locations will collapse into one or the other. And so it's use it, that's the idea when, when gra gravity would, I think um, this was mentioned in the, in the introductory talk that, that um, um, <clears throat> was made and, and uh, but it's of course we've got no, nowhere close to seeing like a thing like that. I mean, what we are seeing to see, seeming to see uh, is some effects which seem to be quantum effects at levels which I guess people had been very skeptical of at one time. Um, and it's just nice to see that these things are moving in that direction. Of course, it's a long way from seeing the effects where you get deviations from the standard behavior of quantum mechanics, which is what the OR suggests, is that the consciousness depends upon this phenomenon where um, the collapse of the wave function because of gravity comes in. And the collapse of the wave function is part of standard quantum mechanics. It's just um, a contradictory part of standard quantum mechanics because uh, you, 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 according to standard quantum mechanics, you get the Schrodinger equation, the system should follow the Schrodinger equation, but it doesn't because at a certain level, you get these amplitudes superpositions involving these complex amplitudes become probability superpositions. And this is not the result of the Schrodinger equation. It's something outside the Schrodinger equation. And the claim is that this is the OR part of orc OR. Now, it would be very interesting to see something which starts to grope, starts to connect with that, um, uh, that part of the theory, but I, I guess we're still a long way off from that. Um, but just to see see that you get collective quantum effects, I suppose, and and um, I like the point that Arat made about the uh, microtubules. <clears throat> if you have the thirteen thirteen row ones, then you they they're, they're straight, whereas if you have fourteen, there's a slight tilt to them. Now, this is one of the things that, often, that struck me in the early days, that you, the microtubules, which seem to be present, at least I don't know about other systems, but at least in humans and presumably mammals normally, I don't know how, how, how far down it goes, but you do get these straight microtubules, that is to say the columns of the mi uh, are straight. And if it's just some local effect, it shouldn't pay any attention to whether they're straight or not. And there must be something which is gaining, gaining from the fact that they're straight. And it could be some electromagnetic effect or something. And I remember once reading about um, nanotubes. These are carbon tubes. And you got some particular effect when they happened to be straight. You had the periodicity in this, along the line of the tubes. And that this was connected with the occurrence of superconductivity conductivity and things like that. And I just wondered whether there was something like that going on at a different level altogether with microtubules. And as Arat was explaining, you, you do seem to get um, in, in, the, in the 13 ones, you, you get straight lines, but when you have the 14 columns, then they aren't quite straight and you have a different behavior. Whether that's important in things to do with consciousness, I think we're a long way off from understanding, but it's interesting to watch from the outside. And I'm not an expert in any of these biological activities, but I like to see how things are going. And uh, I'm impressed by what's been done, I have to say. But it's a long way, there's a long way to go. Excellent, thank you very much. Well, we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for your work, so thank you. <laughs> Stuart, do well, you have any comments you'd like to make? Well, thanks, Roger. I, 
I, uh, I'm just going to ask a dumb question. Uh, I've learned over the years, people have said there's no dumb questions. So I'm going to ask both you and, and, and uh, Travis. Um, and uh, it's about subradiance and superradiance, which I'm trying to wrap my yeah. head around. And uh, uh, we, uh, I learned that uh, superradiance actually was initially described by you, I think, initially. Not Having by me, no, no. Maybe it's my brother. <laughs> no, with, with, no with black it's holes. No, it, was, it was something about you can gain, a uh, system can gain energy from the black hole because of the helical uh, vortex or something. And uh, Oh, no. Oh, I see. Well, you, get, you can get energy from, it's completely different. I don't think that has any connection as far as I can see. Yes, getting energy out of black holes. This is right from the rotational effects right and uh at least uh in, in our discussions some of us actually aristide thought that it, it may be general generalizable to what's going on in the sub in the super radiance and sub radiance and microtubules so my 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 dumb question is uh could the transition from sub radiance to super radiance in a microtubule be a, be a uh, reduction, be a uh, objective reduction or some form of qu quantum state colla uh, collapse of the wave function? Well, it's a quantum effect, clearly, but um, I don't know, well, I don't know. I mean, is there some, your, your question is, has it got something to do with the reduction of the state? I mean, yeah, I'm asking whether the transition from subradiance to superradiance might be a collapse. I would hate to try and answer that question because I'm very I'm ignorant I'm about the enough. effects involved. Travis, I, I'm I'm not familiar enough with the with the mechanism as far as the crossover between subradiance and superradiance. Uh, Doctor Shen might know um, from from his from his diagram there what he what what I seem to have gathered. I could be wrong. Is that at at shorter time scales it exists in a um, super radiant state. And once you cross, uh, was it some threshold, I believe, Dr. Shin, I see you online again, that you enter into the uh, uh, sub radiant state. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, this threshold, I want to say, is just a criteria to, uh, to define the, the, the two classes of emission. So, but the decay rate for different modes Actually, even for subradiance itself has many difference. Can be, you know, just ten times longer or thousand times longer. So, and for the question of trans uh, transfer from super to sub, actually, if you write in this way, the the whole emission is superposed of different modes. When incident field is clear out from the system, th those Quasi modes from super to sub are quite are just independent. You can say, yeah, that's my point. So, so can a system that is currently in a subradiant state can it flip over to become super radiant? You need inputs to, so it's like you are um, switching from this case. This case is no incident fields say the emission is only determined by their neighbors and your solution is just the superpose of that the mode the weight of different mode are fixed now for this case you have external excitation of the system you, you pump energy in and the weight of those modes are start to change then it's uh, you can say the weight of different quasi modes are coupled that, that's a kind of transfer I mean, the question is where you get something which involves you see in, in, in following the Schrodinger equation you have amplitudes these complex superposition you have a superposition of different alternatives and they involve complex multipliers when there comes a point when a reduction of the state or collapse of the wave function takes place they become probabilities so it's when the more the born rule gets played in, in a quantum system. So when something becomes a probability, whereas previously it was complex amplitudes, that is it does involve the collapse of the wave function. 
I don't know whether super radiance involves something of that sort. I've, I've not, not, I'm not familiar with these things, I'm afraid. Yeah, um, for sure, in practical case, uh, you need to describe in a statistical way, like there's, um, but in, in this model I describe actually, it's, yeah. you can also observe it in a classical, like two tuning yeah. forks. I see, so, you, you get like, like tuning forks um, mm -hmm. going into, into coherence. Now, is that, if these are quantum systems and they do that, does that involve a collapse of the wave function? That's the question. That's a point. Maybe it does, you see. I, I hadn't really thought about that. We're thinking about, um, what do you call it, when you've got tuning forks, is it, is it in your example with the tuning forks? It is a synchronization problem. Well, you get, yes. It's a synchronization I, problem. They right. tend to like to be coherent. Right. Now, does that involve a deviation from the linearity of the Schrodinger equation? And maybe it does. I mean, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a very good question. See, otherwise you, you simply get these things all acting together, but th th there's a preference for them acting I, coherently with each other. Yeah. Now, does that involve a collapse of the wave function? I don't know. Probably we need to look into more carefully, differently. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think there's a good chance it does. I, I, I'm, I'm, I haven't thought about it too much, but that's... In, in this system, co coherence between multi-oscillator is a must, but I, I don't see, say, to describe in this model wh why we need quantum language for, for that. And does it have only happen only with big systems? If you have simple oscillators, two oscillators and then... Yeah, yeah for, for atom, for sure. No. Yeah, yeah, but I want to say, um, so for classical, systems or this simple uh, deterministic system, it may say exist in different types of oscillators. Uh, even for si simple atom atomic system, uh, you should somehow see it. Uh, and it has and additional- It get lost in, gets lost in the, in the environment, is that right? Do you have a- Yeah, it's an open theory. system. So, this is an open- It involve collapse of the right. wave function, but it's usually uh -huh. incoherent, yes. It is an open system. I have to think about that one. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe that's true. That if you have a, I mean, suppose you just have atoms, and they're not if they're coherent. I mean, there's no reason why, if it's just linear, why they shouldn't just oscillate in their own merry ways. Um, but if they, something gets lost in the environment, I suppose, and that might prefer cases where they're acting co coherently with each other. Mm. And that would involve a collapse of the wave function if that's happening, because it, when the environment, I mean, that involves in the a environment, of right. displacement mm. of the material yeah. in the environment. But usually it's uncontrollable, so you don't pay much attention to it. Mm. Did that answer your question, Stuart? <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, but I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> got a lot of good, good uh, befuddlement. Uh -huh. So that's a good thing. I guess one question would be uh, in the subradiant state, are there, is, is there superposition? Because uh, you need that uh, to lead to collapse by Rogers mechanism. So the subradiant, uh, whether it's the, uh, the electron clouds and the aromatic rings and the dipoles in superposition. So do you have something superposition that would lead to collapse in a subradiant state? If you want it to be in a definite energy, that's the sort of thing you get to quantum mechanically. Yeah, that, that would involve a, a wave function collapse usually. You have something which is the state as a whole wants to have a definite energy. And that after it would have a, have a superposition of different energies, and then if it settles into one energy, right, that would involve a, a collapse of the wave function. I mean, you it turns into probabilities. You see, once your your amplitudes turn into probabilities, that's what 
that involves the collapse of the wave function. Right. So that's not the Schrodinger equation. Um, but that would, if it's the environment which gets involved, whether well, you have a big enough, the quantum state gets spread out through the environment and then you can have the collapse taking place but uncontrollably. Of course, it's no good if it's uncontrollable. So, so the, somehow the conscious brain has to do mm. something which, which is controllable and it it's, makes use of it in some way. Well, maybe the, the uh, superpositions are, are secluded in the nonpolar regions and uh, avoid, avoid the uh, environment. So it could be by uh, objective reduction. Yeah, you mean it's doing it itself. Well, it'd have to be a big enough system that it could do that. Yeah. I mean, so, if, we're, if we're talking about single photon effects. Pardon me? I said, if we were talking about single photon effects, as, at least from my, my understanding, is the wavelength of the photon is still going to be quite long. And so as, as it's interacting with the entire microtubule, it's going to collectively excite everything. But it will only, if you try and measure it and say which one is is excited, it's only going to be one of them because you only have enough energy to excite one. Yes, well, so, but it has to be the same. I mean, the photon itself is, won't collapse the wave function. I mean, that's just going to be linear. But um, if it couples with some massive system. Well, yeah. we, need, we need entanglement of a lot of tubulins and the, the photons within them to. Uh, to yes. Or. Yeah. There could be some coherence between them, between right. lots of them all, all over. Yeah. Well, I'll take it as a maybe then. Maybe. Definite maybe. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, it's a big maybe, yes. <laughs> okay, I would like to thank all of our panelists uh, for, for, for some very stimulating talks, uh, some finally some experimental evidence. I would like to thank uh, uh, Sir Roger and Dr. Hameroff for all of their inspiration and all of their input on this project. And I'd like to thank you all for coming out today at uh, the beginning of this conference, which I'm sure is going to be quite uh, stimulating. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.